says we're live. Ed, you want to check it? Sorry, Coco, you want to check it? I figured. And add it to the uh, code. Cool. Welcome back, guys. Hope everybody uh, had a good time last night and is ready to hit it hard today. Um, so we're going to start with Tempest. Uh, Slick's been doing a majority of the work for that, so I'm going to let him kind of uh, tell us where he is, what we've been doing, and then we can talk about uh, the next steps for testing all this stuff we're going to write and um, not getting screwed by DevStack when it changes. <laughs> not getting screwed by DevStack when it changes. I'm not going to go that far. I think DevStack is perfect for a development environment for OpenStack. But we just don't have any tests for it, so how can it know if it breaks us? True. Uh, it may be the same. Sweet. <laughs> what? No, you see the little triangle on the bottom and it's glowing? It's on. Boom. HDMI 2. Hopefully that's your... Yep. Is that your background? No. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> Express 220 HDMI. Yeah, so here's the thing is... There he is. Uh, it's, it's the Apple TV, right? <laughs> <coughs> We're good? Yeah. Sweet. Um, <laughs> Let me shoot off a link to uh, the Etherpad. Cool. Since since there are a bunch of new folks uh, in the room, I thought I'd just start off with a little bit of uh, background uh, into how we got to doing what we got with Tempest and and uh, sort of what historically what what we've done. So. Um, how we got here, in the early days, there was pretty much just Red Stack, uh, Stack Trove integration, and it was all wild, wild west. Um, the, 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 um, the commands that you also have grown to love, uh, Red Stack install and kickstart existed, and we sort of preserved that through the changes uh, that we made, made and uh, Red Stack uh, in test was there to, to run the integration tests. Um, slowly, what we've, we've done is we sort of moved all of the pieces that were needed to do the actual install of the Trove fits from out of RedStack. So before, um, when even before we were intubated as a project in OpenStack, we sort of moved to this hook in DevStack using local.sh to, to do the install of the API uh, and task manager. And sort of when we got intubated, uh, we moved to the, the live under DevStack. So right now where we are at with DevStack um, is that we're a service in DevStack, and so once you enable the service flags for Trove and TR integration to your API, um, using the live DevStack goes ahead and installs Trove. Um, just a back, a little bit of background, and and feel free to feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions <laughs> in case something is not clear. And uh, a bunch of you, Great Max, Hubcap, have a lot more inf information. Feel free to jump in. It's, and correct me, or if anything needs to be explained a bit more, yeah, just feel free to. Um, so a uh, bit about, I'm not sure why this is blinking, but hopefully it will. Can 
Uh, let's everyone just look at the Etherpad. So yeah, it might be easier. On the TV. There's, there should be a link on IRC. So. And it's, <laughs> and it's also on the Trove Meetup main page. I'll put a link to it. Um, just to give you a bit of background on the, the types of tests that we run and where they get run in this, the sort of gating process. Um, so there's, uh, at a high level, three basic levels of tests. Um, there's the, the unit tests that get run, uh, that they make heavy use of um, mock objects, um, mo uh, mocks. Uh, and uh, those well, We do get, use like three different types of mocking. Yeah. He's, Historically, I think there's never been pockets of people who favor uh, favored certain types of mock objects over others, and uh, I, I think it's it's been that way through OpenStack as well. And there's 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 been movement to get consensus on on mock rather than magic mock or um, I forget the other mocks. one. Mocks. Mocks. Um, but um, so so I'm not sure where that's that's headed, but whatever sort of. OpenStack is doing with that will probably align with that. So, um, but um, so what I wanted to say is that those the unit tests are run as part of OpenStack CI in OpenStack Jenkins. So any time you make a change, submit a pack, patch set to your, uh, via Git review, um, the tox tests get run, and and those unit tests get run as part of those tox tests. Um, there's also the fake mode tests, which basically, so Trove has a dependency on all, all of these other OpenStack services, there's no mode or whatnot. Um, and the fake mode test, basically, there's a layer of fakes in there that say, hey, if a call comes in to Nova client to provision a Nova instance, I'm just going to say, hey, it's done, sort of, and, and, and return. Uh, and so those also get run on through the tox test when uh, OpenStack CI Jenkins runs Tox. Uh, and the, the other thing that also gets run is sort of a style checker through PEP8 and, and what is called OpenStack hacking, uh, which is a sort of custom style check for OpenStack. Uh, we also have the integration test, which instead of faking the stuff out, sets up the whole stack on DevStack. So you have a working Nova, uh, Nova working Glance, working <coughs> Swift, excuse me. Um, and then runs basically what is uh, an extended version of those fake tests at, on, on the whole stack, but not in fake mode with the, with the actual underlying dependencies on these other open stack services. Uh, the integration tests are different from the, the other two uh, sets of tests, as in they don't get run uh, as gate tests on every uh, merge to the gate, but rather when you create a patch set and up upload it to Garrett, there's this um, other Jenkins that we've set up called Red Dwarf Jenkins that runs all of the integration tests uh, and <coughs> posts a plus one or minus one vote on your patch set, which the core team then looks at when they're merging the code. Um, and, and at the summit, uh, Jablair told us that we could make that voting for Trove if we wanted to. Once we, once we move that into their, like, Framework instead of using our own thinking. So. Um, <coughs> so there's there's a couple of uh, of challenges with that, and uh, mostly being that we'd have to sort of <coughs> fit into the the dev stack and the dev stack gate model and figure out how that runs uh, the 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 Trove integration tests, or we we sort of figure out what sort of subset of tests go the tempest way essentially, and figure out what subset of those tests we want to run or if, if we can get equal sort of um, coverage from Tempest as, as well as our in test. So, I, I mean, eventually in an ideal world, we'd want to test everything that we we test in in test uh, on a Tempest chicken. So, so Tempest, what, what is Tempest? Uh, so it's, it's basically what we have for RD Jenkins, but across all the OpenStack services. Uh, the key thing uh, being there uh, is that, again, a set of live OpenStack services is set up using DevStack, and then um, your, the integration tests are run against that cluster. There, there's a um, few differences. Like, for example, DevStack doesn't use any of the actual 
uh, Python clients that any of the services have. Uh, so that they're, they're making curly curl sort of curl calls to at the rest layer to figure out sort of what um, what the request response looks like and testing purely based on that. Okay, so I have a question. Um, the requirements for Tempest, they actually include Python D clients with client, Nova client. I so think there's different suites, right? Different test sets of tests. There's like scenario tests that will actually use those, right? Right. So so there's there's separate tests, not testing the, the the REST interfaces, but testing the clients themselves. So do they the REST interfaces that Tempest creates, is it plugged into the clients and then into the clients? Um, so no, there's sort of separate services that define, hey, this is what my REST client should look like, which are completely different from the Python clients. I guess my, my main question is, do they rewrite the entire test to test those clients? Um, they, yeah, they do observe. So I know for a while they were doing that with JSON and XML. So I don't know about like the heat, the new heat clients and the Python clients. I haven't looked at those tests specifically, so I can't really talk about that. But okay. but for the service tests themselves, they're implementing sort of a basic uh, client in Python themselves to 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 actually hit the endpoints and, and do the testing that way. So. Um, so one thing, so I know uh, Robert Collins, he said, well, we want to do this because we don't want to have false positives with the clients, right? And he said that, but when I was looking over the wiki, I don't see that mentioned anywhere. The thing that they cite is that they want to be able to test JSON and XML. And I know in our client, we have ways to do that because there's basically hooks into the inner body of it. Um, and to me, the big advantage of using the client has always been that for dog fooding it, right? We want to show like the user, yeah, here's the canonical client, do this, here's the use case, or even in the wiki. You know, here's the use case how we'd expect data storage to get used. You do something like this and it would work. Um, it sort of keeps that language common in terms of the Python code. Uh, so I was wondering if the powers that be with Tempest, what their thinking is on that, if it's just because they wanted to keep it flexible or or what? And, and honestly, I'm not sure because I haven't really reached the, the, the question of, hey, we're interested in sort of using our own client to do some of these testing since we have those hooks in there. That would be something something great to actually bring up and talk with them. Is it run on a nightly schedule, or is it, it can't be every patch goes through the suite, is it? Every patch does go through the suite. That's why it takes so long. In which order? In which order? But just by chronological order? No, there's Zool, and the whole OpenStack gating system picks up through the queue, like which next patch. Okay. So, so I mean, maybe, you mean the gatekeeper? Yes, the gatekeeper, the OpenStack gatekeeper. Might be a chicken and egg thing with the client, but you know, we always run into the issue with the client being upgraded first and then brace the integration test. We have to do some of what we do to get around it, but yeah, but that also brings up the issue. I think, that's, I think we, we make sacrifices to, to do that. Yeah. You have to, you have to projects, you have to make sure that they both pass. Yeah. yeah, but the funny thing is, I mean, Tempest is going to be running Trove, right? So if the client's updated for new changes in Trove, for new functionality, which we all think it needs to be, then Tempest should have access to everything. Because at the point you're running Tempest, you have access to the entire stack. So. Yeah, so I, I don't think that, that I, it, it, you know, in a perfect world, we would be doing that. So I think that it, it would make more sense for us to talk to the Tempest guys and to urge them to do that rather than try to come up with a conclusion here. Just because, like, we can have, well, you know, something there's, great, there's and then they just right? say, like, no. Like, so, for example, if there's a not use of client, like, because they say, well, this violates sure. well, our, our beliefs. So all I mean to say is there's no representative from Tempest here, so yeah. it's kind of hard to say, you know, hey, why are we doing this? Like, why, why does this happen? Because... We don't know the answer other than what we've read in the wiki, right? We don't have the, the three years of context that Sean and some of the other guys have that built Tempest, you know? Okay. So that's it. I mean, we're trying to figure out how to start, like, getting the ball rolling on these Tempest tests, right, from this meeting. Yeah. Um, I'd love it if we could start writing them, like, really Let, Let's put, a, let's put a, like, a, a wishes for Tempest section and add that and, and add Because I think we do need to talk for that point of view. Is that right? I'm reaching the conclusion that we're going to do what the other Tempest tests do in order to provide the same integration that the other Tempest I, projects I have. I would like to err on the side of doing the thing that seems to make the most sense versus just looking at what other projects are doing. Right? Because I mean, I think Docs is an example. We sort of said, well, we've got to move it in here. We talked to Andy and said, you don't need to do that. So I think let's just kind of have that conversation soon. And I think if they say, well, we can't use the client, but we should look into doing it, is using the Tempest style clients. And then call the red board client or the trove client. So, so I think that yeah, I, I won't trust giving it to people if we're not running it in the tests that we say are the official. Well, the scenario tests are probably going to use the clients. 
Okay. Those are like the big profile. I mean, potentially, I would look in this scenario test and see. Um, but I think that we're going to exist. Maybe we should talk about like the six different types of Tempest tests. Is that on there anywhere, or did you want to pull that up so um, that we can get an understanding of? We're, we're always getting ahead of something. <laughs> Somebody go find the car. <laughs> or the horse, right? I have a question. Uh, yes. Would there be only one single gate for all the OpenStack projects once we move away from the RD Jenkins to the formal gate? Um, I'm trying to see if the waits would be longer, the queue would be. So oh. to, <laughs> to give you a sort of idea, so the, the Tempest job right now, the work that we've done, we already have a Tempest uh, non-voting gate that's running as part of every check-in, as part of the OpenStack CI gate. And it's, it takes about an hour now. If, if you look at any of the recent check-ins, maybe I should pull one, one of those up, you'll, you'll actually see, I think, Tempest TDSM pull as, as one of the, the, the things that get, get, got run. And right now, it's non-voting, and it's experimental since we're still messing with the gate. But um, the idea is that whatever uh, set of tests we move over from RD Jenkins to uh, Tempest, those will run. And those will take about the same time, but it won't run separately on RD Jenkins. It will it will be run on on upstream OpenStack. So that, that has its own advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, the, the the primary disadvantage being now we're sort of in the same queue where uh, if the OpenStack Zool, so Zool is backed up or whatever because of merges not making it, we're we're part of that. Um, advantages, hey, we get a lot of the the sort of Historically, we've always had our build break often because of some change to DevStack or some change to, to Keystone or something like that that we have not been able to catch and be aware of. And we've lost a few days trying to figure out what happened. And we, we'd be gaining on those as well. So we get a lot of that goodness there. And, um, and I'd also like to add that the smallest uh, time frame for the whole entire review process is the tests. It takes way longer for a, for one core member to even look at your code the first time than it does to run the entire suite of tests through Zool. So once the code, once you're done and everyone, you know, and, and it's ready to go, if, if it would take another, you know, six hours before it, things are, you know, completely merged and run, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. It'll also mean that we probably won't start looking at code that doesn't already have you know, a plus one from the testing framework. But in all honesty, how many times does a core member look at your code the same day you publish it? And I know the answer to that, right? Um, zero. So, so I, you know, I don't think that it's necessarily worrisome for us that, that we're going to turn our you know, one hour test into like an eight hour test, just because that's totally not the long fold in the text. The only thing I, I do feel a little bit of concern on is running the test more quickly. I think I think that's yeah. Well, I think that's completely valid, um, and I don't think that anyone in OpenStack runs the entire suite of tests before they check in, right? Like we should be we should understand that that if we're pulling you know DevStack and Nova and all the other projects are there, we don't necessarily have to test them because they've already passed yes. their gates, right? It's really about testing our subset within Tempest. Is that even possible? Though? Like right now, when you run these tests, it's running all Nova, all Swift, everything against. Well, we're not running any of the real tests in Tempest, right? When you just get into Tempest and run Tosh, you don't run you what run Tempest, what Zool is running. Well, right? Right? right now, it's running everything, right? It's all the projects. So I think there are different groups again in, in Tempest, and you can define it so that you're only running certain groups and not others. Okay. Um, so it's definitely not spinning up instances, though, right? And it's definitely not actually exercising. No. Things. It's more For like. Yes, agent instances, it's definitely not. Right. So, so right now, it's uh, the, the experimental gate is only doing stuff like, uh, I believe, just very basic like flavors and API hitting that. So, why does it take an hour? Um, it's basically it's running the default group on Tempest, which includes a bunch of like the Nova stuff and, and going through all of the DevStack installing and, and whatnot. So, I mean, there's definitely fine tuning and tweaking that we can do. But that said, the hour that I throw out is not the hour, like the figure that I was talking about is not the hour here, but the equivalent hour in RDJ, which, which is what we want to get to, right? Because we want to have all of the guest agent stuff spin up and, and, and those tests go in and, and those take about an hour.
you say that uh, <coughs> that uh, one of the advantages that we're gonna pick up on the desk that you know I mean, we won't bring on desk that have sort of some problem you know, that right? so that means that other services gonna be running our suite or of uh, pro test in um, in Tempest. Uh, you know, for the meeting and all that. That's the idea. That's the idea that some of the basic Trove tests to, to ensure that Trove is up and running get run as part of the whole Tempest suite that other projects run as well. So, so is our is our ultimate plan then to, to decommission our current integration tests and move all of those into Tempest and make that just sort of the one test? So uh, that, that's a very good question, and that actually ties back to Tim's question earlier because there's a lot that we do in in uh, Trove integration, that's not entirely black box. Like, there's, we have these points inside. Sort of I mean, they really they run from looking... integration to functional tests in places, right? Right. So I mean, so and, and I'm not sure what sort of framework Tempest has for some of those tests. So I'm not sure how well, they do have are... a, a, a black box section, a white box section, a scenario section, a closer to unit test type. Uh, uh, thing as well. So there are a few. They may not all be in the same group, but they will in some form or fashion be replicated. So, so it, yeah, I don't know if we want to start talking about Short answer, that. yes, and I'm, but I'm not sure how long it will take us to, to get there. Sir. We, we need Tempest. I mean, so there's some features right now. For example, the fact that if you are trying to write an integration test, you can run it in fake mode and basically get feedback very quickly to see if your test is working. Um, to me, that's a useful feature, and it should be possible to use it in Tempest, but that's difficult. Like, how do you make that work? And to me, I can think of a way to do it that would involve just having access to both repos. Like, I could set up the script to do it fairly simply, but... I well, think so, right now, so here's the, the deal, though, is that, <laughs> like, when we talked about this at the summit, and we talked to Sean and some of the others, yeah, like, Nova can already do this, right? You can have a fake rabbit in both, and, and, and it will call synchronously, um, Without dealing with that, right? And and there's a fake compute impl that you can just spin up 50 billion computes and see where you know yeah. where the uh, the bottlenecks are, right? So we need to make sure that we build it such that we can spin up those fake things. And if those don't exist, then we have to talk to the groups. Like if there's not a fake glance or whatever, and we need that, then you know maybe we have to. And if they don't no. care, then maybe we have to spin the cycles to yeah. add to that. I don't. I think what Sean was talking about was faking everything. So faking like Nova, faking Lance, faking the whole stack in different ways that was compatible with certain things that, that they wanted. And I don't get why we can't, we can't just use the fake mode we have today, right? I mean, because honestly, if you look at it, we have fakes that we already have created. Well, but but, we but think about this, right? right? Immediately. But think about this. We have a client, yeah. right? And. I mean, what we're doing is we're changing the impl of the client in a config value, right? Which is exactly the same as what Nova would be, what Nova does to fake its stuff. Yeah, but how so often would we fake out like by using the Nova fake compute driver and then somehow call that the probe? Well, so we would Tell spin up a trove it. instance and it would fake create one on the back end, right? And then when we called list instances from Nova, it would have that fake instance still because it's in their database, right? They, their, their data store is spun up. All those things exist. It's just the actual resources don't get created on the back end. Okay, I think the complexity of doing that and making it like sort of trying to be fake everything because to my I don't yeah, it's too much harder really than what we're doing for all of OpenStack. Like I know Nova has a fake driver, but Nova sort of is built just on top of itself. But that's the only thing we talk to. Yeah, I mean practically. He, yeah, he has their own fakes <laughs> that they wrote for all their unit tests and their functional tests that they're running, which is very similar to our integration tests. So, you know, I don't think Keith right now is saying, well, let's go and make the talk to the fake Nova drivers before we Fair can't enough. move anything in. But I feel like we're putting an onus on ourselves to do all this stuff, which isn't necessarily, like, I think we're stuck trying to say, well, we've got to move all this stuff in and do it the same way that everyone would really like it. But I don't know if, I, if we should gate ourselves on that. Like, when we already have a way to run things and basically set up a fake probe API endpoint, and since this is just meant to hit a normal API endpoint, we can fake probe out however we want. Like but we also have the ability to change. keep our int tests running and our fake mode stuff running as long as we want. Yeah, but I'd like to get the fake mode stuff running with Tempest so we can start developing it. Uh, yeah, that, that is a good point. I mean, seriously, like, so we have a, a person in QA who is in India right now who is writing tests because they use fake mode, so they don't have to worry about, like, the latency over the network or getting anything. And then they're able to actually find all of the syntax errors and the little kind of errors. Have you ever run a test and you're waiting for like five minutes for it to spin up an instance and it's like, oh, I misspelled that. And it's the most annoying thing on earth. 
I mean, that's sort of an advantage is the type mode test is sort of the compiler. So if we can get that into Tempest and run it quickly, I think that's a lot of value. And I, I think sure. the discussion of using the other you know, project is the big distraction. Right? I think it's a great idea, but I don't think we should say, well, we have to either do it that way or just will not have this functionality. So I, I, I completely agree with you on like, that fakes are super and they have their own advantage, especially when it comes to like um, being agile with development and like getting to know what mistakes you're making what with coding early. I'm not the, the only piece that I'm not clear on is like I'm not sure if fakes live in Tempest because Tempest that the idea of Tempest is uh, to spin up the whole stack and test whether like different component open side components play well with each other. Right? So I think all we need then is if we could somehow pull down Tempest and I mean, because Tempest just sits an endpoint, right? So if we can start throw and fake mode, which we have the ability to do, um, we can just hit hit it with Tempest. And maybe we just make like a, a game job of some kind that does this so we can have slightly bit faster feedback. So the, the problem is it's in yeah, a Tempest, repo, What so you're saying is classic. Tempest is not aware yeah, of, of, of our fakes. Yeah, the dev stack will reset it up to yes. where it runs in the fakes. So, so Tempest is after that, some of this last night. Not everything that you do can run a thing. There Not are everything things that are going So you're effectively You, you can't log into the database. No, unless you went to a anything, lot of work. No, no, but by guess. saying that you're going to pull down Tempest and run it against fake mode, you're effectively making a dependency which says everything in Tempest shall be able to run against fake mode. No, or well, you're saying everything in fake mode should behave somewhat reliably. And I think we already do this in Tempest with proofs, right? Like everyone's deployment is going to be different. So Tempest already has to make sure that it can allow for subtle changes. And really saying that it's not going to do certain deep tests, that's just the same as saying it's only going to run certain groups. So for example, like when you pull down Tempest right now, you're only running against Trove. You're not probably running all the tests against Nova when you're developing. Right? So again, in an ideal world, yes, point, probably. Right. In an ideal world, you're using a group that's only running the specific Trove test, if if at all you're you're yeah. you're doing that. I mean, in an ideal world, you would have enough coverage using the unit tests and the fake mode tests. That you'd, you'd be good enough to say, hey, I'm going to submit this to Garrett and let, let it take care of running the Tempest test and seeing whether I break Nova or. But, but I mean, that, I, that should I not have one other question to ask. If, if you have a syntax error, right? Yeah. Or you have a logic error with an if statement, right? You forgot a not. That, to me, seems like something that a unit test should be able to handle. In theory, the unit test should Of course. Just like type systems and you know, sort of compiled language should also catch all errors. And well, they things. catch they compilation errors. Yeah, I mean, they don't catch everything. Of course they and don't I, catch everything. I honestly feel like fake mode but, is but capable what of catching exact, more well, stuff than the unit tests, because the unit tests are sort of written by the people who are writing the code as they're writing it. So they're sort of... But you're specifically saying that we're right. using the, unit, the fake tests to, to quickly find our problems, such as syntax errors, such as <laughs> logic errors in the code, right? And so to me, it seems like if we covered that section, even with code that we knew, we would find a syntax error, right? Are you talking about just having unit tests for everything? Because historically, if we do that, I don't think it provides the same level of coverage. So for I example, think turning on JSON you... schema, that whole feature could be tested in fake mode. Sure. Um, you know, the XML API, but, the big pain, right? If you can test the whole XML API using fake mode, you didn't have to remock out of everything. Um, all I'm saying is I think we should preserve this feature. I'm not talking really about. So, it. I, so I don't I, think and we absolutely are in the tox tox yeah. mode test, right? Yes. Yeah, so like the right. tox tests still are and will always run in fake mode, and yeah. and and, and <coughs> I, there, there's there's definitely value in that, and we should not change that. Yeah, and I'm thinking that there's I think there's got to be some way we can download Tempest. I know we have to coordinate them with another repo, and it's going to seem kind of tricky at first, but I really do think it's doable and it'll provide some value. So. So um, Tim, please add some of those notes to uh, the like the bottom or somewhere on the wiki to discuss it because I don't want to lose that. Okay. Because we're gonna have to go back and talk to the Tempest guys if there's anything we need to change with the way their stuff works, right? If we need to have like a special trope hyphen fake, you know, and they're like, oh no, we don't want you to do that, right? We have to just let's just let's write this stuff down so that we're so that we can bring it back to them. So when we say like toss will continue to run these fake mode, doesn't that mean that we're gonna have to write our tests into different places? Well, that's what Tim was talking. That what Tim was talking about somehow coordinating with Tempest and get Tempest in that right. So, so right now that the way it is that the tests come, the fake mode tests and stuff live in the Trove repository anyway, and Trove integration just calls into that with the specific group ID. So, I mean, 
So the way we have it set up, we don't have to write it in two places, but there is the reference element that one probe integration needs to know about the tests that are written in, in sort of the other repo. So, so there is that dependency. <laughs> OK, so um, I already quickly sort of covered the motivation for Tor to be part of Tempest. Um, so link to the blueprint, and we, we spoke about uh, some, some of So coming to like, what, where are we and what are the next steps to sort of figure out how to move some of the trove tests from trove integration. Um, there's a bunch of notes that we took from the last summit um, when we ba basically briefly discussed how we're going to do the whole guest agent thing in, in Tempest, because uh, a, a lot of the time that uh, Trove integration actually spins up uh, or takes while bringing up Trove is actually building the guest agent image. Um, and uh, that's time that sort of we talked about um, how we can shave that off by using cached images somewhere that are built, say, periodically, like a day or um, every week or something like that. So there's some notes from that. Um, but even before we sort of, sort of got to getting some of the guest agent tests running in Tempest, there was a lot of work that sort of needed to happen for uh, us to move to the model where the OpenStack model where sort of certain things were expected in certain OpenStack CI repositories and things like that. And so um, just quickly enlisting what, where we are now and What's what's needed? So um, so right now, Trove the, the install needs to happen entirely in DevStack, and we were at a point where that was happening in DevStack, and there were some challenges where sort of as new stuff keeps coming in, it sort of gets added to Red uh, RedStack, and those need to go back into DevStack. So for example, some of the uh, um, data stores versions code, some of uh, the newer features that came in, uh, in order to get a full install working in DevStack, that needs to be moved out of Red stack into dev stack, um, but but and we should be doing that by default, really, and, uh, and yeah. as core, and, and we should be policing that, right? Because we're like, what is what is Red stack doing besides using dev stack to spin up everything? I, I think it's just a, a, a matter of uh, as core understanding that we're doing everything in dev stack now, uh -huh. and that any new changes that come to Red, Red stack, we sort of. Uh, minus one them and, or minus two them and say, hey, this thing needs to be in dev stack. But we will end up dealing with the problem that unless, I mean, it's the same kind of problem, but unless you like actually ping a few individuals, things don't, I mean, well, Dean's been really awesome in that every time we've had a breaking change, he's plus two approved it really quick. But I mean, there have been some times where we wanted, like, your stuff, the initial stuff to get in dev stack really did take a good period of time before we could. Oh, yeah. Even use it, so we may need to with Redstack use that code that that I wrote like a long time ago to say apply reviews in flight on top of the code for for things like this, so we don't have to deal with. So and, and and another thing that that's really good uh, if we want to get something up and running quickly for Trove, but it's taking a while in DevStack is using the local sh hook. So that, that it could be that you have a, a review pending, but at the same time you have something in. And maybe I should throw something in, in uh, Trove integration that will let us use it more easily so that you can have this that's pending for now be installed as part of that stack using local.sa. Or maybe we put that into Trove as like in contrib so that we don't have to deal with three lines of code being in Trove integration and, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of your work in Trove. And then you're like, then we have to coordinate. You've got to check this one in first. You've got to check this one. No, we can't run the test because they're failing. So you got to pull these three projects down and run them on a VM, right? So maybe we just have, move have that stuff way. in and just say, don't touch Red Stack Trove integration anymore. Yeah, that's, that's a nice great idea, actually. Because so what else would really be in Trove integration at that point? You know, I think we have, like, some tests oh, that really? only run. I, I, we should just move it into the, the Trove test, right? Because um, and then yeah. that repo, I think it's just too much. I the third one. Yeah, and it's kind of goofy that like we, it's it's the only project in slash OpenStack that is like completely weird, right? It's just a, our nasty bash scripts. Um, <laughs> so it, 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 it looks bad every time I go to like slash OpenStack and I'm scrolling down the projects and I see this like nasty trope integration with all of our ugly hacky. So I mean, I'd rather look at the ugly hacky bash scripts from some other project. Yeah. <laughs> 
and, and frankly, even in Launchpad, it's overhead that we have to manage, like, bugs or blueprints uh, yep. uh, exactly. or whatever. So, so I, I think that's a good idea. All right, well, Something just so noted down. That, that, yeah. That, yeah. As a matter of fact, put it on the top, copy and paste it 10 times. <laughs> So, um, so basically, then, what is Red Sack today? Like, it's like the prep is what we're saying. It can be. I mean, I don't, not necessarily. I'm yeah. saying making changes to DevStack in the future goes into Contrib. Okay. It, it will exist as an artifact today, but in all honesty, we're not really touching it that much, short of adding, if we add tests, I can understand that. But if we're modifying the batch scripts and not removing code, that is a flag that we should be doing that somewhere else. <coughs> Um, so right now we have the, the support in OpenStack CI to run the, the actual intro Tempest job. Um, that's all in there. Uh, the Tempest and the DevStack hooks to be able to say, hey, Trove is installed, so I need to run the sort of Trove gate test because the, the Trove, uh, uh, the flag is set to true or whatever. Um, that's all in there. Um, the, the, the piece we're, we're at right now is basically moving over some of these API tests from uh, Trove integration to uh, Tempest. And so I sort of went through sort of a high level of what, what sorts of tests we have in Trove integration. And um, pretty much sort of the, the basic API tests that um, don't require the, the guest agent spin up or the cache piece that I was talking about that we're still working on. Um, are, so there's there's a review out for it. Uh, they changed a bunch of the ways in which they do the client odds, so I have to make a, some some changes to that as, as, as yet. But it's in flight, uh, and there's a versions one coming soon. Uh, but here's here's really where I need help from some of you guys to say, hey, um, I, I'm interested in sort of figuring out what Tempest is doing with with with, with some of this stuff. So I. I can pick off a couple of these items and sort of move these tests over from from integration to Tempest, and it's it's really a great way to sort of navigate the the, the Tempest code base and sort of figure out how, how it's doing things and, and sort of learn that that piece. So um, I'm not sure, um, and some some of you guys might be interested in some of these pieces more than others. Say I don't know, maybe the data the database pieces, um, user access, security stuff, or backup and restore. But uh, if you're interested, uh, just feel free to start working on it. And um, this this list is also there in the blueprint, so people are aware that somebody's working on some of these pieces and moving them, moving them over. Uh, so put, definitely put, put your comment or put a name against it with, with the review link or what, whatnot. Question? OK, so um, we talked about uh, a few summits back, like, OK, so we're moving stuff to Tempest, and right now we have these tests, which will basically, they create one instance, and then it gets passed around like the village bicycle. Everything uses that instance. It's really gross. It's global. Um, and you know, the thing is, we should have made a better way to create instances and reuse them, right? So here's here's the thing I'm wondering. There's this thing called test resources that I always hear about. <laughs> Has anyone looked at that? Because I've been looking through Tempest, and I can't find it being used anywhere. Like when I've gone to the summits, they say, this is the official way you do a Tempest test. So you have these test resources, and it solves all these problems. I can't find like code that's using them right now. And so I'm wondering, what's that going to look like? So for example, like if we test instance actions, and we have a, you know, we want to test like resize, and we've already had a test to create the instance, are we going to have to create another instance just so we can resize it? And then we're going to have to create another one for the line, or can we reuse it if they go back to active state? Um, as far as I know, the, the Tempest tests, or at least one of the big things of Tempest is them to be able to run the test independently, uh, since they do run using TestR in parallel. Um, and so I, I think that uh, being able to, as, as long as there's, um, be, being able to sort of have some of these reuse scenarios will preclude being able to do that. Well, and so actually Test Tools has this thing called Test Resource, which was designed so you could reuse it while also running stuff uh, okay. independently. So you could use stuff in isolation where you basically make it from scratch because you don't care about these 15 other tests. That so I haven't seen it. So I haven't seen anything in Tempest use that as yet. So so that's that's something that may, maybe it's just we, we have to figure it out. How we we have it. been told yes it works and it should be. And, I just I and just it's wish magic, could find right? it somewhere you know in the code. We'll let so you I mean, write it. It's it's probably cool. something that we need to do. So that. that's actually I'm not. That's probably a good thing. I'm that wondering. No one used it right. 
because then we get to use it to our needs, as opposed to, you know, you listening to me parrot the same thing. We have to do what the rest of OpenStack is doing, right? Okay. So then that's a good point. Like, I think we really need to, to talk about this a bit. Um, if we have some sort of utility class to say, hey, I have an instance, stick it back into this, like, runtime cache of sorts of instances. And then the later test just says, I need an instance that's active that is not screwed up. And it can just go and grab this and use it again. That yeah, would but, make it possible. But we're talking this. about, as Ed and Ed went out uh, a few, few days ago or yesterday, uh, the laundry problem, right? Like, how, how long does it really take uh, to do 100 loads of, of laundry if? Or what would, can one of y'all explain it real quick? Yeah, okay. yeah. In his analogy, he is just explaining. If you've got a washing machine and a dryer that each take half an hour to, uh, to do their run, it takes an hour to do a load of laundry. But it only takes an hour and a half to do two loads of laundry. Yeah, but if you go to the dryer and it says, okay, now that you've done washing the clothes, step one for the dryer, wash the clothes again, then put them in the dryer. That's right, what I'm saying but, work, But right? what I'm saying is we have 100 washers at our disposal, and we can run 100 I'm, tests I'm at the same do, time. I don't. Okay? I don't have a giant fleet of hardware that I can say, yeah, just go use this for half a day. I also enjoy the ability of like massively refactoring or changing stuff and being able to have some insight into whether or not the test passed. Like, there's been a number of late nights where I'm trying to get a release out, and I'm running through all the tests to make sure if it, you know, if it's working or if I can say that this is the next build we should go to. And maybe QE is looking at something else, but I like the ability of being able to run this stuff. And what I'm hearing is this feature was called test resources. It's not used anywhere, and I think we should just go ahead and add it. We should figure out some way to do this. So, again, it's, just, it's sort of like the same complaint as with Facebook. I just think we need to find a way to do this if we're going to go full steam ahead. So, there's no reason we can't, right? So, for, from what I've seen, of, I mean, from what I've seen of our test, we definitely have multiple instances coming up, and if, if we want to be yeah. able to use some of the parallelization stuff, it seems like there's no way around it. We just need to figure out how to use it, and 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 figure out a way to use it in, in the Tempest test, and and it's something that I haven't seen in the in the test before, or, um, and 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 the only comment that I'd say there is. And some of these, well, while we're figuring these things out, there's there's a lot of resources in, in OpenStack QA and a lot of people who know a lot more about like the history of Tempest and why they're doing things a certain way than others that have those conversations with them so that uh, they're aware of why it makes sense for us. And, and when the patch finally lands, they sort of hey, are, are not like, hey, what is I, this? I, I, I'm, I'm I, not I sure. I don't want to because, rude, but I don't want to wait for anyone else's patch to land on this because this is something. This is no, no, I'm saying when our patch, our patch lands, they don't go WTF. It's too right. abandoned. Right. Okay. Does not take long enough. Minus two. Yeah. Run this five times in a row and then. Start or how about uh, makes makes test dependent on each other. Minus two. <laughs> makes test dependent on each other, just like every single test. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's another story. Yeah. The class thing kind of bothers me at Tempest. Everything's using the class variable that I've seen. So. Anyway. Um, so, so the other big piece that I briefly mentioned on before is, is actually like figuring out how the, the guest agent gets cached and, and run. And so, so that's sort of precursor to <coughs> um, some of the, the, the guest agent's test being able to run in Tempest, because we need to have that as part of that um, to be able to spin up instances. So, so that's pretty much everything besides listing flavors. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And, and, <laughs> And, and so that's in flight, and that should be out shortly as well. So um, uh, pretty much that's where we at, we're at. So I don't know if you guys have any comments or questions or um, if you've already started filling out maybe pieces of things that you're interested in looking at. A uh, uh, couple of challenges along sort of the way that, that I've seen or, or um, while, while writing this or while figuring out some of these pieces is um, Things are always moving all the time. Uh, installs are changing. Um, so things that, and, and, and as, as we're progressing, we're sort of making some decisions to, to make this better. Um, so saying things like, hey, we'll have a contrib section that things can go to so that they can get, get into DevStack so we're not in this place where we need to move stuff from <laughs> integration to DevStack. Uh, features are changing. Um, so integration tests keep getting added to 
trove, trove integration, which means that those eventually need to be ported over as well. Um, not just that, lots of changes in from in Tempest, them, Tempest itself. So a patch that sort of you submit. So generally, from when the patch is submitted to when the patch lands can be a while. And in between, you have to sort of rebase your code and, and, and uh, uh, or even change things drastically depending on the underlying uh, uh, sort of framework that's changing. Um, um, and this, coming back to what some uh, what Hubcap was talking about uh, with uh, the heat client and whatnot that recently is is now in Tempest, we need to figure out a way to um, how how we can add our sort of trove client to Tempest to test it and to leverage some of the hooks that we have in there to to test our stuff as well. So um, I really haven't had a chance to look at any of that. So um, I'm curious. I want to throw something out that is maybe not 100% related to this, but We've been talking about it for a while. Moving the guest agent out of the Trove code base, I'm almost curious if we should consider making that a higher priority to this, because otherwise we'll end up having to do things a very specific way, right? With with the agent being in the code, and then write some tests, and then massively change things along the way because we're kind of moving the the guest out. I mean, maybe we should put that as a top priority item. Um, <laughs> In order to Look, get all this stuff, would that be a good way of saying <coughs> that you didn't break everything by moving it out? No, I guarantee you will break everything yeah. by moving it out. That's, mm -hmm. what, I, that's what I'm saying. So you have we have test tests, written, right? You have a test written that like, asks you to move it. Sure, but we already have that. <laughs> but yeah, Mike said that there's going to be work because the client. They're saying because the I, I, I have a feeling that DevStack and Tempest are, we're going to have to do a decent amount of rework in order to uh, make them prerequisites for moving the client. And then that's two projects that we don't own. So the time frame in which they get merged is going to be different. And we already have a suite of int tests that do, in fact, test that everything works when we make changes. I don't know the background, but what do you want to Oh, oh. We, should pull up, we should pull up the ether. Isn't there an etherpad for that? Yeah, we're talking about this tomorrow. Okay, basically the guest agent, the reference guest in Python is mixed with the normal Trove server code base, which means if we ever say, let's make that a little bit skinnier, let's make that sort of make sense on its own, it is difficult as a developer to reason about what it's doing because first off, it has access to everything else, so it can import uh, massively expensive stuff. It can do little silly things like talk to the database when the developer working on it did not intend for it to talk to the database because the code is just sitting right there. Uh, it makes packaging a little bit more it, difficult. It's a ton of interdependencies, right? And yeah. packaging problems. And frankly, not everyone is going to use the same guest, too. So it's, it's code that doesn't necessarily need to be in there. And all the other OpenStack projects in general favor smaller repositories with single purpose as opposed to having two purposes, two packages, single repository. That's why our client or you know the, the Python Trove client lives somewhere else. That's why the integration test lives somewhere else or the int test lives somewhere else. That's where that's why we want to move that up as well. Will the will the client or I'm sorry, the guest will have dependencies on the Trove proper package? It no. should not. But it does it right now, right? Because it doesn't call back to do anything. Yeah. Well, it, we'll find out. Yeah, it, it does. It does, but it, it, it shouldn't. Should. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Another thing about it is that we don't install Trove on each guest. What? <laughs> it's only my phone. 16 gigs per guest. Oh, that scales, though, because then the guest could also be a Trove server. Oh, yeah. Trove on Trove. Oh, okay. Whoa. I can install itself. Trove section. Become self-aware. And you know, honestly, if I'll be here. I know that Infer really likes having everything in their own repo. I wouldn't even mind if it was in the repo, just in a different root path, so it's easier to reason about it. But I guess they still want it to be. In well, we would have we we would then actually have packaging issues with that based on what they say, right? We can now everything is in one package now, right? It's just the Trove meta package. Multiple packages. So there's Horizon has multiple packages. Horizon has Horizon, and then the OpenStack dashboards. And they live alongside each other. Mike, that's not fair. They got base. It's in the same code base. It's in the setup config. They just have two. Really? Because we were told explicitly that. We that can't have two setup pods. We can have one, 
that does both. I don't think that's what they said, was it? I mean, that, I'm not saying that that's not the case. I totally believe you that it is the way it is today, but. I think we were just saying I think we're we, we, <laughs> <laughs> maybe step to moving it out to its own repo. Fair enough. Put it in its own module and then like, make sure everything namespaced is proper. Like it's not importing anything from Trove. Yeah. And then then if we want to move it to another repository. Yeah, may, there may not be a need for it because we will end up with like s s the stupid problems that we have where we have three different repositories yeah. and we're changing code in every one of them. And they're all interdependent. And then and if we we're just shooting ourselves in the foot again, I, I feel like something will get away. Well, oh, no, not you can just add a, a new set of At that point, should we move the client back building. into the trope repo? Yeah, yeah, can we move the client also? <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason it's not in there. It's going to make it a lot easier make sure we don't have all these weird interdependent changes. Yeah. <laughs> no. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Topic for next but, week. I mean, com coming I back. client should be completely right. Like so for the record, we are the only group that has a problem with that because we're the only group that's using that the client tests. to test Actually, the just, server. Just simplify. We're the only right. group that has tests, right? Like Nova did not write major integration tests. That's why they're like, oh my gosh, we need Tempest because this isn't working. We had tests from day one. We were using the client so we could give it to people. I think that's that's a really honest thing to do. I'm not going to feel bad that we have problems with that. There are seven every morning. <laughs> Could you look at the camera when he's talking? To you? <laughs> but co coming back to uh, Michael's point about uh, Hubcap's point about uh, the uh, um, whether it's going to be so. So the, the main dependency is going to be in the in the elements pieces, whether we move the guest out or not, and um, depending on whether we want to have a v1 of whether we own the elements. Um, we can still build the image and cache it and keep the elements around before we make like a transition to like the triple O elements repo or something like that. Um, and so we could still do a bunch of this stuff um, and not have to go through that sort of churn with those guest agent changes when we move it out of the repo um, and sort of do them side by side if if we don't move out the elements uh, until later until that happens. So that's a good point. We still control the elements. I'm, or we control the frequency of merges for the elements. For the elements, right. So, so maybe something something that would be good to do there is like make sure we get this uh, infrastructure up where we can build and have a cached image. You're still using our elements in our repo. Move the guest out and then move the elements over. Um, and and that's something that we can talk about. Yeah, and I, and I do think that the first step, irregardless of <laughs> um, um, the, the, the Trove client, I mean, sorry, the guest agent, is we have to get the elements being built and cached by DevStack. And then guess what? That's also more code we get to move out of Trove integration. Hooray. Um, so, you know, I don't think that we have to wait to start that one. Quick question. So elements is in the Trove integration, right? What's the connection to the guest agent? It, the elements build the image. Right. Oh. So and the guest agent will need to be installed in the image in some form or fashion. That's the right. right. So the connection is the guest agent. Well, what do so we want to bake the guest agent into the image? Well, we can't necessarily bake it into the. Well, we can. We so that's a good point, right? The when when wow. we build this, we do the R sync in order to. So like, let's say the guest agent was its own repository. <laughs> um, OpenStack has this, you know, tarball of so I, that or whatever. Yeah. Where you, every path set, you can have it build any tarball. Why couldn't we just have the image always match the latest? So that's fine. All I'm saying is there's going to be a change to the image once you have <coughs> a different way building the guest agent. Right? You're still going to need to change the elements to figure out how to get the image. Well, not necessarily, because we should still strive to keep the every time I spin an instance up using the development image, I get a new guest. Right. We've always said that the image we build is not for production; it's for development. So, you know, the, one of the best things as developers is that we can spit, we can edit guest code, spin up a new instance, and it's so, good. Right. So, no, so, so I'm saying exactly the same as you. I'm, I'm not. Well, what I'm should... saying is maybe it's not a function of the elements though, because they're pre-build and build of image, and this is like a shell script. Well, I guess that would be in the, the shell that, script. That would be, be in the elements, elements anyway. Right. You're right. So how to get the guest would be in the elements. Right. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting problem because we were, you were talking earlier, Mike, about putting stuff into Trove and Triv because we have to wait on DevStack changes. So just so we can fix it in the short term. 
Okay, so I don't know if this idea will go over, but what if we had a contrib extra tip of stuff? Right? So like no. Yeah. I don't know, like, if this stuff gets checked in. I guess we'll have it on the blueprints and we'll figure out in that way. So So um do we want to tr maybe spend a few minutes to figure out what what maybe throw out some ideas for how we can get the get I mean if we're done with Tempest or when we're done yeah. with Tempest. No, no we can no, get the guest much. out and maybe using like you know pip or whatever we however we want to install try to come up with a smart way to install a guest on an external repository without an ugly rsync and you can still code locally or deploy using um, I mean not deploy but or run dev stack on in the gate and everything's peachy if if that sounds good it sounds like we've kind of started to go that route anyway right yeah, I, I think pretty much now the next big step is is building the the, the guest image elements, and that that directly ties in with that. So, um, I mean, I don't want to derail. So, if we do have specific Tempest questions, let's let's stay focused on that. Um, questions or so? There's different types of like you said. There's scenario test. There's trust test. How do you know? I mean, when you add a test to this virtual, you add one for each type or. So you make German word of word. They have a tag pretty much when you write the test, you tag it saying that hey, this is a negative test, this is a scenario test. And then those get picked up based on what sort of flags you have set in the dev stack gate job. So is it is it so an different an sets of or a decorator or something? Yes. Not, okay. It's pretty much a decorator. Cool. So one thing that was I was unclear about uh, um, oh. Go ahead. One thing that was unclear is that uh, we as a contributor um, Moving forward, you know, let's assume that you know, you know, we are integrated with Tempest and all that, right? Um, whenever we add a new feature or you know, or whatever, are do we start running tests against uh, in temp test or 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 you know or in uh, you know uh, what we're doing what we doing right now by adding the testing and testing creation that's going to be referenced somehow later on, uh, you know? So I think there's still. Uh, a lot of unknowns about Tempest that we need to figure out, especially when it comes to the guest agent and guest related tests, that we're not there yet, where we can say all new tests need to go into Tempest, but eventually we'd like, I mean, I think we should get and, there. And we've also got a problem where we've, and a present company included, thrown things over the, the, the wall, the fence, right? We keep saying, yeah, we're going to have Tempest tests, so don't worry about testing this. We don't need to test, we don't need integration tests to test all the data store stuff. You know, because it's going to be in Tempest one day. We don't need test to test you because it's going to be in Tempest one day, right? And I know Tim is grinning ear to ear hearing me say this right now because I feel like this has been going on for, what, six months at least that we've been saying this, and we've just been dropping the ball on, on integration tests. So I think that we need to, as a group, until we get here, with probably six more months before we're here, we need to, especially the cores, focus on making sure that we have int tests. Yes? No, are you talking about the int tests we have today? Yes. Right. The tests we the have test today, we have continue test. writing them, or it. sorry, start writing them again. So, so here's, okay, so uh, we could actually run the int tests for some of the tests right now by simply changing the code configs, right? So for example, Mongo, Aiden or just some of the simpler operations that have been Yes, yeah, spin up an instance, make yeah. sure it's active. Now, this basically means in Red Stack, we run it test twice with two different configs. Now, um, if we're staying with Proboscis, there'd be some cool way we could probably reuse that stuff. And I think ultimately, when we go to Tempest, we'll want to create classes and then somehow find a way to make subclasses of those to test base functionality with the different uh, types. But I think right now, as a, as a good strategy, we could just run both, like one for each data store. From Red Stack. Yeah, but wouldn't right. they need to create an image for both for each data store? No, because we've made it so a general image can load any uh, data store. Right? In That's theory. It. In theory. We don't know <laughs> if it works. I have no idea if anything with my SQL works right now, honestly. Yeah, I mean, the Morantis um, guys did do a lot of work because they, they, when they came aboard initially, they wanted to have a vanilla image to be able to install all this right. stuff. So I don't know if they're still testing it, but they, you know, Andrew. Uh, when he first came aboard, was totally like had that in mind and was focused on that, especially with the um, Red Hat stuff. So, so it may work. Probably not now because it's been you know eight months. A but vanilla image of ours of what we already have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Not a, not yeah. It has to be okay. our vanilla image. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other question it's around French that. Vanilla. 
the other question around that that I have is then do we test every data store type that we have on every integration? I think if we're going to say that it's working, we should we should add that for now. And I think the problem is we're concerned that we're going to add more integration tests to the old stuff, which is valid. Uh, but I think letting code in that's not tested at all is probably the worst yeah. thing. Possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and frankly, we don't have a million VMs on our local machine, but the good folks at HP are running the um, integration tests for us. So instead of running the entire suite of integration tests for MySQL, the entire suite of integration tests for Cassandra right after it, let's have two tests. Yeah. Every time there's a there's a commit, you know, we have two runners that run, and they both plus one or minus one, uh, depending on if changes happen. And then it'll be faster, at least, or it'll be the same speed. It won't make it any slower. Yeah. Well, it, the number of runners that can run is still the same, so it, it's still adding more jobs to the queue. Yeah, the, the problem is, yeah, but, but at, at least once your job is running, it will take the same amount of time, I guess, which is what your point is. Yeah, and actually, we could probably... There's some stupid tests. I'm sure all of us have run into these that say, make sure a list instance works. Oh, wait, I, I didn't. See, I saw two instances instead of one. Clearly, the oh, one God. is broken. Those are like the worst tests. Maybe we should actually just go through and remove those, because we could kick it off multiple times. I think we should totally, if you have to run something to rerun the integration tests, yeah. our integration tests are bad. <laughs> Because basically we have, well, I don't even know if we still have it. It's like something initialized that would go clean up after ourselves. Yeah. And it's because really, we did have a bunch of silly tests. It's like that. look for the literal numbers of things. Yes. There's only a few, but they screw up everything. We just need to, if we could just clip those or fix them, then we could say, hey, kick this off. We could have multiple <laughs> runs of that test running with different data sources. If a resource is an issue, it would not create like a, you know, like a small test group or something like that for each. There are still those supporting, you know. Yeah, that's, the test would be like, you know. That's what I'm small. suggesting. And we'd use a configuration. Yeah, and then uh, the, 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 when we, the game, we just run those small tests for each particular that are storing. It would be faster, you know, less runner for game tests, you know. Right, so I mean, we still run the integration test with MySQL and then have a different group that runs for each of the other data stores or something like that. Yeah, or that makes sense. Cool. That was an ether pack with the guest agent thing breaking out that, that you wanted to. I. I don't have my laptop it's uh, filming, so I don't know. I don't remember where it was. It's somewhere in the ether. Pads. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I don't know. Coming out to. Oh, are there any more questions? Just set a hand up or. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the gating after we move to Tempest, um, is that a way you could select for every path set, pro path set that gets submitted? You only run the pro Tempest list and not the entire open stack Tempest list? Um, is it in our control? On your machine, you could, right? Yeah, so but we actually we don't want that to be the case in the gate because we can't guarantee, right? The good We have good faith that because Nova passed the gates, it's not going to mess up with us, right? So I actually would prefer to see it run all the tests. The, the great thing about this is it makes other teams dependent on our stuff too. So right. if they break Trove, um, so they can run our tests. They will have, we to, have run. to run theirs. We are no, it's deep. both ways with Tempest. Like they have to run ours too. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying we are sort of using Nova as a black box, right? Yeah. What is the point of testing Nova all over again? Yeah, yeah that's like, yeah, like, I don't know. Why would you want to run Nova? I think the thing is. I mean, so for a tempest, they should. Be for them, yeah, it makes sense that they can break that. Yeah. There's so, no way we can for, for Nova, why would they want to make sure that Trove doesn't break it? Look, at the end of the day, every patch is going to run every test, right? So, I mean, it seems like it would be much more complicated to to change things. Right now, it's like, if anything fails, something's wrong, and your patch isn't going in. The bottom line is you find out immediately as opposed to have to dig. Yeah, yeah figure out what's wrong. Nova, right? You get a meeting response from Nova, that's a big fail. It's not. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, coming back to, to Mike's point, right I, Right now, I think that the, like, getting someone to review or patch takes way longer. So I don't know if, and it's, I'm not, um, and OpenStack CI is not low on resources or anything. So I mean, there's, there's no downside to having those tests run. If there is, or if it starts becoming painful, then yes, we can look at how, how we can not have some of those run. Any other questions? 
Great, great job. Um, so coming back to the, the guest agent discussion, because I don't want to lose track of that. Um, I'm not sure. So we, we mentioned that we wanted to have like a good first step be maybe take a look at what Horizon is doing with Horizon and Dashboard. Mm -hmm. and, see if we yeah. <laughs> and just move things into slash guest agent as opposed to slash trove or slash trove guest, something like that, trove hyphen guest. Um, I, mean, I think that's absolutely valid. There's no real good way to say, is there a good way to police the, the dependencies between those two base level packages? As in, can we make, can we programmatically make sure that everything in Trove guess doesn't depend on something in Trove if it's in the same code base? Yeah, because what if you're on a different path run? Okay. That was totally know. for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've basically been staring I, at I you. I was like, but, I was like space now. Okay, so, <laughs> so we have, we we want to get rid of the problem of having dependencies from Trove guest, in, or sorry, from yeah. Trove in Trove guest. Is there a way to programmatically do that when it's in it at its own base level um, project? Uh, I mean, sorry, in the same project, its own base path. I don't think so. Oh. Yeah. We can say, like, okay, so we just have to eyeball it's changes. Say, you could see, like, if it's importing Trove. Well, for sure, like for sure. Oh, I like what you're saying, <laughs> rep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, now, now, the way that um, um, Horizon does it, I mean, is it just that they have a root level set of a root level yeah. project like we have Trove, and then there's some other directory, and then that's its own root level thing? So you, you're you going to install both of them, right? You're going to install, it's just two modules, right? So set of config can have multiple modules. OK. Yeah, we just suck it. Python, uh, well, period. It, it, <laughs> the, the, rule is, the rule is there's only one set of pi per repository, and it's in the root of the so, as we so, said, root. Yeah. It's on the roof, yo. But I mean, ultimately, we want to build the pro package and the guest package, right? So, set of pies and hundreds of two. We'll do that for Horizon. It it will package them together. In two separate so like, pies. if we were to push so it when to pi pi, then it would still be one package. Yeah, it would be trough. Okay. And then, but what you could do is you could you could um, you could create another setup config, and then just pop that in, and then run like build the package, and that would just build the guest. So you could just say like, oh, I only want this uh, module, and then change the dependencies in that setup config file. Oh, so everyone with trough gets the reference guest sort of included. Everybody who installs Trove, yes, by default, it would get you guess. But you could. And, and again, this is only like a short to medium term problem we're going to have, right? Yeah, if right. I even call, if you even call it a problem. We're, we're already installing the guess right. Trove. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and splitting it out would be really easy if it's in its own package. Like you just you just um, update your stuff, build your package for the guest. And then distribute that to your guests. And we're doing it for Horizon, so I guess it would be cool with that, right? So I think that's a great, yeah, great first step, at least. I mean, we, I know we've talked about moving the whole package out, and that would mean we have another separate repo. And frankly, I don't know how much of dependency we have there. I know we have some stuff that's dependent on the drone modules, and I don't know how painful it's going to be config, getting rid of that. Configs and um, there's some. Util stuff probably, yeah. right? Just some little things. Um, and frankly, if we're using it, if we're using utility in both Trove and Trove Guest, it should probably be somewhere else. Oslo. <laughs> It'll a little bit weird to have to include Oslo. Same repo. Not, not a biggie, but. What do you mean include Oslo? Well, you have like Trove, and then you have like Trove Guest, and then you have well, OpenStack Conference. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that's absolutely the, valid the, if we're going to be moving it. The Guest should hopefully not use too much of That's a good point too. It might only use one it should module. Be Oslo can be big. Some would say hell, I would Oslo. say let's use JSON. Rob, this is being recorded. Oh, is in like config. Oslo config. I mean, that's an absolute. <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> tying us to it for the guest either. I mean, that's not a bad idea. And we definitely don't want to use um, Oslo messaging because it's big. In yeah. terms of how much, like what the overhead is of installation, the cost. Fair to say. Well, we could make it. I think we should make it pluggable. Well, I mean, I think there's good things about. So I think that they're that they're bad. 
tab and just say the reward button. Yeah, so we are <laughs> they're meant to be run on big, Correct. you know, Python scripts. So I think it's I'm sorry, sorry, services. Let's make Oslo selectable, right? So you have RPC strategies, and right now the one is Oslo. But if you wanted to do something in the future that was like that was different, you could do that from the guest layer. And if you wanted to have your guests be smaller and not include all the bulkiness of Oslo, it's not really. I don't know how bulky it is, but if you didn't want to include that library, you could have a choice on. Yeah, I just think messaging RPC or whatever, something's going to have to be learned. Yeah. Yeah, some kind of communication. So just changing it from an option to a required dependency to an optional one. So that's another question with the guest. Um, we need to, you know, I think in the future we need to figure out ways to not import everything. So, for example, if the data store um, is uh, Redis and we have all this stuff where it's importing SQL Alchemy for, you know, to try to talk to SQL, we should figure out a way to stay clear of those paths so the Python process doesn't bulk up when it's being run. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great first step, actually, to identifying some of these dependencies so we can get them out of there in the first place. So uh, I, the, I think we've got a good idea for where we're going to go in order to separate the guest. Let's move to how do we get the damn guest on the instance, right? Let's talk about the development, for like how, how a developer would be able to spin up a new instance on their box or in their cloud for testing and, and you know, like, how do we replace our sync? What do we replace it with? You build a tarball and stick it yeah. in Swift. Or, or tarball and stuff. Right, and then RPC message just the UUID of the Swift object, and then on initialization it goes, thank you, pull it down, right? You've added a dependency on Swift. That's theoretically the open stackish way of storing an asset. Like or, or maybe we right. store it in Glance. Can you store something like that? Yeah. Like the well, isn't Glance no. just no. using no. Swift? <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. So the, the thing is, we can't enter the official builds for upstream devs. I put it in turbos, so no, 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 but it doesn't. That's gel totally well with valid, the, and with I think the dev, that with the dev the, scenario. That should be the default, right? right. It should, we should pull from turbos, dot, 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 period. But that doesn't help. On your dev box. Right, right. Yeah. So, but we have to think about this as it has to be kind of the same path. But we need to finagle something, right? So maybe we have to tar it up. Just like, I mean, maybe the Swift thing isn't a bad idea for local development as long as that's not the well. So I, I so really just like just it. trying to think through the dev scenario. So how how does like if the initial guest comes from somewhere and then you set up rsync from somewhere, is that acceptable? I'm I'm not sure. I mean, it's I don't painful. want I don't be, want to do that. I don't want it to be manual or different or something that a developer can forget to do, or something that takes a long time, like rebuilding an image every time. So I do think that you have to be able to pull it from your local uh, machine into the VM somehow. And I, I, maybe the Swift thing isn't a bad idea, because it's just a, I mean, you're not really putting a dependency on Swift, you, you per se, have... because it's just a, well, the way you're talking about it, if we were to do it, Via the gas or via some, but it would be hard to tell. You can't really tell the system. It would have to be something in the script. So maybe we do just pull the highest. We have some sort of count and maybe pull the newest, yeah. the newest yeah. object, or maybe we just nuke the old one. Or yeah, anything. and then that's sort of what the script does. The script on install on, on on start just says, "Hey, I've got this. Pull it from my local Swift, which is you know running right next to everything else in the screen." I, mean, I don't think that's a bad idea, actually. And then, and then we can just say, you know, tar it up and push it to Swift, which will probably take about two seconds um, if it's all running on desktop in your local machine. Or it's starting. Yeah. I mean, you're just so like a like like different request. Did, that, did they say no? That's forbidden. No, use our sync. No, no. So only in production, you should. You definitely should. Well, not for the right, dev scenario. So like if your argument should be the same across all the way, right? Arguably, I, I kind of don't like these scenarios, in which the way it works in dev, there's somehow some presupposition that like somehow they know that they should do this in production, right? I mean, no. Well, I mean, how do they know, really, if, you, if they don't know what they're doing? Ultimately, yeah, I mean, it should be the same way example. across all different environments, if possible. Right? Yeah, it the and same pulling other a projects as well. What's that? Is it the same way in other projects as well? We, we need to have no them. other projects yeah, have a guess that, well, that they do. Well, yeah. some other projects do now, but there, there's got to be a historically no. called staging stack, where you make the image normally, and then the dev stack, we just start something. 
Right. Well, I would still like it to be at least in the same format, right? If it's going to be a tarball, it should be a tarball, whether it, you're pulling it remotely. Because well, basically, if you're so, not modifying the guest, like, do you need to so pull it's the... In the same repository, or, or it's in a separate repository, right? You could just um, do Python setup, pip install, or, or and then push that to Swift, and then pip install that URL. Right. So I don't think that, and that's, that's not crazy, and that would work for production as well. Like, yeah. So I, I, I do like the idea of it being pip installed on the machine because that it, it's Pythonical, right? That's the way to install stuff. Right. <laughs> but doesn't that also limit you to only a Python guest? I mean, if you wanted to test with a different guest agent. I don't know. There's so many. No, no comment so there. Yeah, because we are a Python community. But so no, then you have different believe image in other languages to begin with. Right. right. The image would be different. Everything would be different in that. And I don't think that we, as public trope, should, um, should this is deal with that necessarily. I think that's something we shouldn't for say no to. Infrastructure, the service, straight one, straightforward way. Right. Right. And so it all makes sense. But that that same that same methodology of pushing, so you could make a Debian package, push it to Swift, and then. Well, then I don't think they want to rely on packages, though. Right? I know. I'm just I'm just giving him an example of like how you could package something other than a pipeline package, right? If you wanted to. So. Another going back to Austin's uh, uh, part that it should be the same whether it's dev or production environment. Can it be somehow not be streamed from the trove conductor itself? The instance need to well, be able to reach the conductor. You gotta, you basically <laughs> gotta <laughs> cart before the conductor. horse at the, or the chicken in the egg. Right, right. Yeah, but trivial. not to API. Maybe there's some port that. Uh, the thing is, you gotta have something wake up on the other side to start talking to the conductor, and that's gonna be that's gonna basically have the gas. So. Okay, so I mean, why don't we say? I mean, it seems like PIP should be the way to go, right? Do we have any? Awesome. You, you might disagree. I mean, using rsync, I know that shouldn't be like we want to do something that is not totally different in production. But I kind of feel like DevStack by itself is. I don't know. Are people like going to production just using DevStack? Is that something that well, operators use? It, no, it does feel like it's sort of the. This is sort of the play toy version of it. I guess Maybe. I'm thinking like also longer term, right? Because ultimately, yeah. in my opinion, if, if you're also going to do like broadcast <laughs> messaging to say like complete guests should upgrade themselves, right? Yeah. Then I would think that the methodology would be also the same, right? You could again cast a message and say, hey, your new code is here. And you might do that in waves. You might do it during maintenance windows. You might do whatever. Again, it's extensible to the point where it can work in multiple scenarios, and that's generally why I like. I agree with you, DevStack doesn't necessarily have to mirror production. But the rsync thing, I don't think it's obvious to a lot of people. At least when I started, I was like, it rsync's from the host. Well, I guess that makes sense so they can't get out of sync. But the security implications there are scary. So which one's worse? Yeah. The possibility of going out of sync or the possibility of getting pwned from a guest, right? Out of sync. Yeah, well, from a dev perspective, it is. It depends on the box, I guess. Just for the box is Yeah, I mean. The other reason why I kind of sort of like the pip install piece as well is because it just has a bit more that you're testing as well. Like, you're, say your guest agent was packed, packaged as a different module, now you're hitting the curse habit, like testing that packaging or what, what else, too. So. And this is going to just be for when we're running it, like, in the Tempest run in the game. I mean, even even in your, I, I think what we're saying is it would be even even your dev workflow would be something like, hey, get the guest agent Python package, install it, and if you make a change on your code base on your dev machine, then run this bit, publish that tarball to, or I mean, have a have a scripty way of doing it so that you don't have to um, like run all the commands yourself or whatever that that maybe probe integration can have or something like that that will do all of this for you and publish it to Swift so that your guest can pull it. Yeah, I mean, I mean the only knowledge I can think of is, is if you reuse like data store tables, right? How they use packages right now, and you kind of just call it a package in a sense, right? And ultimately, you either cast a message or do something that says, "Hey, check your packages," right? And you have a different column that it knows is the guest package. 
the only issue you get into then is if you're working on the RPC layer, in which case you could be introducing stuff that may or may not work or may be different. So you could have changed conductor to send messages and, you know, maybe at that point it becomes a hassle. Although I guess at this point, the environment we're talking about, uh, down, it's going to be Oslo messages, it's, not, it's going to be fairly stable. But it still seems like if you're ever changing that piece, this kind of makes it a little bit weird. <coughs> Okay, I think we kind of spiraled a bit. Is do, Does everyone think it's sane to pip install a URL for an either initial installation or upgrades or testing purposes on a local machine? I mean, that's what, every, that's what we're coding, right? Python. Do we need to depackage install something? Do we need to um, Pac-Man install something? Do we need to RPM it? Or do we want to just pip install URL and be done? So we, we sort of set up a app server right, in Red Stack, and we stopped doing Potentially that. Potentially for about yeah. setting up a PyPy server on the How How so? Has, who's done that before? Well, I mean, it doesn't need to be a. It doesn't need to be a. All, all it needs is. Uh, uh, all you need is to, like, with Nginx running. I'm just saying, if you don't want to use Swift, you want to use a real package manager, right? Yeah, but well, so the, the Python index is not really that complex. Like, Basically, PyPy is just a discovery tool that links to whatever your download is. So we wouldn't have to run a full PyPy. Right. Did you want to be super hacky? It could even specify the URL, right? They used to do that way back in the day. And so, also, what if we had it so we we do pip install, right? No. And we just make it sort of a little bit triggerable. So on your dev environment, you say we'll pip install from this, and somehow. Um, you use SSH or RSync. Is there any way to hook RSync in with the, the pip install process so the URL you're grabbing it from is different, or is that because that's what the guest used to wake up and do? It, it would wake up and it would RSync the guest code over. But so there's any way to integrate that with pip? Guys, say, oh, guys, production. with Swift so you can delete an object yeah, and create another with the same name. But 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 Swift is local, right? Yeah. Swift is is screen. 17, yeah. right? <laughs> sorry, sorry, screen 417. Um, so if, you're running, if you're running dev stack, you're already running Apache. So, and I think we even have Munge Apache. Yeah, like back in the day. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Actually, they got removed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, we could, we could easily serve some static files from direct directory. Run Nginx. But I think the, the, I mean, the question was if you don't want to use Swift, right? I mean, you can use anything that serves a, a URL, and, and you can pip install it. Are you at Visual Spotify? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of very you know, lightweight, uh, lightweight server that you can just run. Yeah, I would just if you use weren't Apache, I mean, just a CNS. Right? Where they would just run on CNS and you would just pull it down, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's for this issue. Swift is probably easier. It's just. That's for the standard thing, yeah. and then you can yeah. start a page that you really don't like. Oh, so all that stuff up. Maybe we'll put it in contrib, do the rsync stuff still. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I I would hate to have to run a sequence of commands every time. I mean, we should have something in contrib that will just do this automatically for you when you when you say, hey, upgrade my guest or something like that. That packages whatever your code is and uploads it to that particular object in Swift. Um, Maybe that's been one of the dev stack cheat codes, the environment variables you said. <laughs> Arsene, please. Down, down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, I don't know. Uh, there was there was some talk about having upgrades go through the API itself, which I think is a good idea. So I'm not sure, not to open a whole different can of worms in this session, but um, but hopefully. And when that gets done, we could use that path instead of I don't know. having to do all of this with the packaging. Cool. That's pretty much all I had. Um, any other questions or other things people want to talk about? This is a giant head. Sounds great. It's going to work. This is still getting good down. So Rob, if you want to, when you're doing that new setup client thing with the guest, if you accidentally were to copy all the client code in there as well, I, I might overlook that when I was doing it. <laughs> 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 Wait, what? Is there something in this table? Yeah. 
Okay, you're cool. Huh? Maybe what? Do you want me to do this full request? Is that just get assigned to this? No, no. So if you wanted to add the, uh, when you're doing the full request for the setup pipeline, if you were to accidentally copy all of the client code in there as well, I might happen to not see it when I was doing the, you know, full request review. Let's do it. <laughs> I might even accidentally click approve. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> a terrible accident. My <laughs> other core members, but you know, once it's in there, of course, then harder sure. to remove. I, mean, I guess I could then do another, I could do then another pull request, request I deleting I it. I didn't yeah. say plus two awesome. by, by me. me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that should be part of it. If, if we're going to move the, the guest code, it should be moved into its other its own top package, and. Uh, it can still import, import from Trove originally, and then we can work through those dependencies in further pull requests. So first make it so that it can be a separate module that just if we're installing two modules, and then then work on, like, let's really divorce it and make sure that it doesn't have any dependencies. Thanks for all you guys who took notes. Um, I'll probably. If there's any sort of tasks that come out of it, um, which there are, I'll probably create bugs of blueprints and um, send links out on the channel. So, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great time. <laughs>
be blowing solid when you push the button. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I would think it would be. We I know. I screwed up. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Looks like that's what happened now. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hey, um, Taylor said it was. No, the, what is it, Randall? The, what king? King Edward VII. King Edward VII. Oh. <laughs> Google King Edward VII. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> and I say, should we put them over there or should we put them close to the microphone so it can be short live stream? Wow, that's a rebate. <laughs> 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 I know, that's his, uh, that's his Google Plus profile. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to do the next one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to do the next one. Okay, so we're going to do the next one. Okay, so we're going to do the next one. <laughs> yeah, whatever you do, don't watch the uh, live stream. Because you'll be off by about 30 seconds. Oh, the TV volume is doing it? Say something, Randall. Something random. No, it's still there. <laughs> but um, well, it's like, it's like, I hear his voice before he sees that phone call. Yeah. Yeah. Just like real life. Your church will never have the image of a person. Yes, like you. Huh? That's <laughs> just like in real life. Yeah, but you can do it. I can't believe 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 it. From, I think you're in an undisclosed location in South America right now? Yes. Did you sound like really, we can't really talk about it, but yeah, it like that's right. right. Oh, I can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, uh, is there any way to hook up to the sound system? Is it through HDMI? It is, but the TV doesn't have audio. I, I it's can just stand just next to the laptop and say I'm what not I sure can. Where, uh, <laughs> Pen and paper and yeah. draw uh, no, your responses out. Yeah, just get some <laughs> cue cards. <laughs> just write the word help. <laughs> Can you hear us okay? Good answer. Okay, I guess this is going to be sort of like great, you know? So, yeah. how does these work? Okay, so try moving your Randall so that you can share stuff too. Did you unplug the wrong thing? No. And then they're really like, the, like, you don't want the dog? Yeah, there's a logo here. And oh. Like, but this one's yours, right? Oh, that's a good idea. Is there an HDMI over there? Sure. I'm going to go to the left. 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 I'm going
there is a <laughs> Let's put the microphone on top of the laptop. I wonder if we should just ask the lady. Oh boy. Is this thing on? Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys fine. Okay. We're having the fun. You're dialing in, and I'm also live streaming the whole thing out for anybody who can't attend. So I'm trying to figure out where to put the microphone for all this stuff. <laughs> I don't see any airplay. <laughs> Turn on the ring. It should be. Excuse me, please. Pardon me, I'm going to change the input on the TV. For airplanes. We saw that, Randall. One, That's if right. airplay actually only goes onto one TV, but okay. if you want sound. It's okay. Then you're on the network, right? You're on the I'm network. on so let me see. Capital um, Factory. And then that little box should come up. Not that one. Oh, it looks yeah. different. Okay. Is anybody else seeing him? <laughs> Hey Randall, you know what we could do with this bill? It's like a lot of screen and two cans. Yeah, yeah, that will work too. Where is this guy? No, like. Where's airplane under? It usually it just comes up. I bet you have to restart your computer. I don't know if you want to do that. What version? How old is this? 2011. <laughs> well, does anyone can anyone see the air display on their for uh, like? They need to be connected to the internal Wi-Fi. Wi pick it up. Capital. Yeah, it's classroom right. Oh, I'm on Capital Factory, not classroom right. You no, know, no, that's the network. Oh. And then the um, airplane oh, little box should come up, but it doesn't. How come it's not showing the? I changed the input. Shouldn't it show like the wake up like the menu screen for for the Apple TV? The Apple TV. Um, on. Oh. You know, Does like that have a remote? But you can like maybe it's on standby or something. I don't know. I don't want to mess around because you guys were doing such a good job. There you are. Okay, so it's up on the airplane. Yeah, but I keep, it needs to be on one, and I can't change it. Okay. And then it's not going to be on one. It's to be on one. <laughs> I don't want to turn it off. Is it plugged into your computer? No. That's to use. It's maybe even. Uh, the um, if you guys are determined to use our plan, no, I think he's he's got it there. So sorry, I don't mind asking about how to change this. Let's definitely show the right now. Okay. Yes. Uh, you that I wasn't going to say anything, but yes. <laughs> this is the first thing people noticed about. It's like a speaker. I thought it was like an optic. Do you want me to ask about getting your I think it's sound so we can talk to someone who's online. Well, I think the only way people do it is through AirPlay, and then it comes through the TVs. Oh, nice. 
you want to yeah, add with a photo of the new clean? Fine. I'm not sure if you guys want to. Maybe that'll work. Okay. Is that yeah, if it's that on here? Probably, yeah, that sounds probably, yeah. What are you doing? What's going on? He's got airplay working with us. Oh, sweet. Um, also, you should share the hands of the Right. So, so tell them we're going to work out, work out, try to add them. Did we lose Randall? Are you on the hang up this way? Uh-uh. That laptop is um, frozen. Don't, don't, don't. Listen to the word. Give. Oh, I don't want to say that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm going to be doing that. 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 I'm going to be
So before we you know start building out clustering and all that stuff using Git, um, do we have an idea of like do we, should we spend some more effort on actually making sure that all the current API calls go to Git and that path works? Um, you know, before we say okay, let's well, start a cluster. I mean that's that's kind of another chicken and egg, right? Because everyone wants clustering. And we don't want to have two ways of installing those right. clusters. Um, so I mean, maybe I, I have a feeling that this single instance stuff will be fixed just by doing the clustering via heat, right? It'll still it'll still exercise the same code paths from the API's perspective, I think. So um, I feel like so as part of the clustering, is heat going to be the default path? I think. Well, what I've said, and I will continue to maintain, heat's the only path. There's no, we shouldn't have two ways to spin up a cluster. Like we have two ways to spin up an instance, or then one of them will become neglected, dilapidated, you know, wrong and broken. So we only for clusterization, and how will And single it instance. Just in single instance, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, heat, heat is going to be the way we install instances, period. This is the way today. Do you want there to be like an intermediate path until we're fully committed to heat? Well, the intermediate path exists today, right? It's the old style of um, installation. Yeah, but you couldn't like say switch now, like from not using heat to using heat, and be able to say like delete this. Oh, so. Oh, so. Oh, so. Oh, so. Hello. <laughs> Red means it's muted, right? Yes, I think it's okay now. <laughs> but you might want to unmute. Fine. Yeah, I can hear you, Dennis. I can't That's good. hear Slick or the room anymore. You, can you hear us? Wait, your mic is muted, dude. Yeah, I know. So oh, my ear thing. I guess you have to. <laughs> This is a problem. <laughs> I can try on muting. Right now, both are muted. Yeah. Hello? 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 Oh, no, I can hear you. They need a. You guys. You need to get headphones on. Yeah, you guys get some headphones on or something. Can you hear me, Mike? Mike, I'm here. Yeah, Dennis, we can we can hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Or Randall, maybe you should go on mute unless. Uh, or all the remote guys should go on mute. I don't think you can hear me, so maybe I should type it. <laughs> I like you, like you should leave like your back when you hear this. It's really the company of that. So where's the microphone going? In here? <laughs> That's going, to be, but it's. I don't think it's I'm feedback of that mic. But I don't even see you on the list there. Right, it's not That's feedback of that mic. That's for the live stream. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry. <laughs> did you tell them to go on mute? Yeah, uh, I think Randall did. It looks like everybody's on, everybody's on mute, but you now try. And turn your volume down. Hello? Hello? So, I don't think we can fix this, can we? Why is it? Why do you have yours on mute and his yes is on mute at the same time? Mike? Right? I'm, I'm muted. Try try not muting. I don't know. The problem is it's coming out of the speakers. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. You, mute the TV. You can't or turn the volume off the TV. The speakers and the mic on. Well, but then we, then we, we can't, can't hear, hear them. Anything. But we can mute the TV. Yeah. No. I've got it. Oh. Yeah, it's playing out of mine. But raise your hand if you have something important to say. <laughs> Can, can you hear us? No, it's totally clear on the TV, and it's quite loud. 
Hey, can you guys hear us? Yes? Okay. So you uh, two are both on mute um, via the TV, so um, it might be a little harder for Dennis since we can't see him, but you know, give some sort of physical gesture if you need to say something. <laughs> Preferably not a middle finger. <laughs> Yeah, we good? Awesome. So we've already done the five-minute spiel of what it is. Um, now it's time to talk about where we're going with it and what the next steps would be. Um, I guess I don't need a whiteboard, and I could probably sit down because I don't necessarily feel great. <laughs> One other thing that not in the integration today is the ability to update a stack. Um, so we can create a stack, and let's say that will set up some security groups or some rules attached to that instance. Um, if somebody wants to actually add a new rule, that needs to go through each via stack update, and that's something that is also uh, you know, not accounted for. Right. Okay. So that's let's let's identify the code pieces that are missing first. That's a good one. Uh, resize doesn't exist, and significant work would have to go into heap for that as well. Um, what else doesn't exist? In, I mean, integration tests don't exist. Um, is there anything else? No, no. Because basically all we have right now is just to create, right? Right. So I think we do need to pony up and actually start uh, doing the work on this, because I don't think that we've, we've kind of been pushing it as long as we can. And frankly, I think that the guys that are doing the clustering are going to, uh, they're going to have to use it, so can't really get around it. The other thing is, I think, um, so I'm not sure if he, the cloud formation type of template if that actually supports Neutron or if that goes to the network, right? So we should probably be looking at moving over to the you know, the OpenStack template format. Yeah, um, maybe we can get Randall to chime in on what the like what the coverage is for the new templates versus the old. Hold on, Randall, we can't hear you yet. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> mute. Now we need to mute. All right. Go ahead, Randall. Oh, yeah. We live. Someone, yeah, Doctor. Oh, okay, cool. Um, uh, the cover is okay. Um, it's definitely encouraged to use the new, the hot format. Um, we should be. Um, Pretty much drawing that line for the for the V10 version of that um, in Atlanta. So definitely encourage you to use that syntax. Um, oh, is he muted? What about? Can you hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, so what about resizing? Um, do you know what the what? I know that Clint talked a little bit about it, and I think he even sent something out to the mailing list. Can you give us the state of um, of confirm resize and uh, in in heat? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, um, we did have that discussion in Hong Kong as well about. Um, adding in some hooks so that you can interrupt the, or at least do your own sort of con confirming uh, for different um, for different operations. Um, I don't know that a whole lot of work has been done on that, to be honest. Um, so there, there's, there's nothing in there now. Um, it's certainly, we can bump that up the priority list um, if needed, but right now you can resize an instance. It's just uh, you tell it 
this is my new this is my new flavor, and it kind of does it automatically for you still. Where I'm muted. He's muted. Okay, so where where do we have any stakeholders here that are going to be doing? I mean, that are interested in doing work in this, other than the clustering stuff, right? Which is fairly obvious. Uh, I, I don't. You know, not really. No, no one really knows a ton about it, and you can see based on our involvement right now, like how high it is on the list of priorities for us. So I'm. I'm at this point. I'm not even sure where to where to take this. Okay, I didn't know if you could hear each other or not. So I have a question about resize, which is that uh, when we resize and heat, like so right now we can create with heat, we could probably resize using the current method, right? Because we have the confirm step where we get to check that everything's right. still running. Um, I know we don't want to do that like forever, but um, what else sort of what else changes in heat other than the fact that it auto confirms? Well, well, I can I can totally tangent us and uh, and ask the question of do we want to use Nova for resizes? Do we do or will Nova even have resizes in two years? You know, uh, Coco, weren't you talking about some cloud providers removing resizes? Amazon doesn't love resizes. Right. So maybe what we should be doing is using data store technologies to resize, aka spin up a new instance and replicate <laughs> the data over to it. Confirm it via our own code and kill the old instance. It sounds like glacial resizes, which was my idea. Although I, name, I don't name things very well, so sometimes people don't like my ideas. It'd be interesting to see operational data on how often people resize once they get into the correct size. Because a lot of times people pick like a small instance and it's too small for them, and then they resize to a larger instance, which is the correct size it's supposed to be in, and probably never resize again. It's like only once they're on a sequel. Yes. You found the best right. Now. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of stuff that you also need with a resize. You need to change the, the config files to the, the appropriate new size and like all this stuff. Like so, spinning up a new one with the appropriate flavors is probably the best way to do it. It also Rather solves the density problem. You but don't worry about keeping space around for resizes and having to move things around for resizes. It also adds a ton of extra problems yeah. for just using the data store technologies for resizing. What are we going to do that anyway, though, with migrations? Isn't that basically what that is at that point? You're you're not you're not resizing, you're just migrating to another instance. Effectively, but I don't know. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily on the short to medium term yeah. time frame at all, or even long term. This is really like a tangent. I, I, I kind of agree, though, that resizing should be migration. Stro should sort of handle them by setting up a new resource. And then talking to Nova to do the resize should be sort of a strategy for making it faster. It's something to be Although at this point we're talking about vastly changing how resizes work. And at like, like, the H, like how HP, um, how do you guys do your resizes today? Because we, you know, we have uh, where all of our data is sandbacked, so it's kind of easy, even if we have to move from host A to host B to do a resize. Right? We don't have to sync an entire data store's worth of data across. Um, and I'm just curious, because not, not everyone's using a SAN, right? That's an optional. And of course, if there's secret sauce or whatever, you don't have to say anything. But you know, we use the optional SAN thing, um, and it makes our life a lot easier. And I'm just curious to know, maybe just any other stakeholders in general, like if they're using ephemeral or if they're you know, using some sort of local disk, like how the resize even happens. We just call it open. Yeah. Okay, we have nope. ephemeral disk, and it copies over the ephemeral contents. Nova handles everything. So okay, so you're, you're doing over. the the SCP. Yeah, that's what, pretty much what Nova's doing. Okay, I mean, would would you guys think that it would it would be a good thing to use data store technologies instead of that? Is, is anyone opposed to that? So you're talking about like as as the rule, always make a new instance and copying everything over. Right. Well, so, copying everything over via the technology of the data store. So you're saying trope. specific to the data store, and not being agnostic of what the of what type of data it is. I mean, it's not. 
you're, you're st I mean, in a, it. So you're saying, like, basically, it, and for MySQL, you basically be doing a MySQL like copy. Uh, or a you could spin up a slave, and, like something to that effect, rather than just copying the binary data over directly. Or I, 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 or this maybe? is what we're asking. <laughs> I, 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 I tend to feel like that takes a lot of the, the happy magic cloud out of the cloud, right? Like, I mean, it's 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 nice to know that when you when you've got resources that can be used, like why can't I just add more RAM to that instance? Like, why do I have to? Go through a migration of, let's say, I've got a really large database in the cloud, you know, and I've got to go through synchronizing you know, a terabyte or a terabyte over to another host. Yeah. I mean, it just. But again, you're also I mean, reliant it, on magic, your isn't provider. Isn't what we're supposed to do is make running databases less painful? Yes. That's why it wouldn't be on the customer to spin up the slave. Migrate the data I and turn it into the master. Pay some sort of penalty for that. Sure, right. but but also it's totally dependent on your provider and the vert technology that you're using, right? Some vert technologies don't do magic resize in place, and uh, and you know when when a resize happens for any other technology right now in Nova, it just copies the entire disk over. Yeah, no, I, I understand how it works. I, I'm just. Yeah. It makes it inconsistent too because resize in place assumes that there's enough RAM or box, right? Like, sure, it doesn't always, it can't always be used. I'm not going to argue, I'm not going to make the argument. Yeah. There's. So, but I don't so like, if, you, if you're spinning up a new one and you're migrating the data over, then you have to, you have to, by some means, maintain some sort of data consistency. And you have, you, you, you then take on the responsibility of maintaining that channel and making sure that. The data stays up to date. So you're actually considering it still an online migration instead of going, you're down for five minutes, you want to change. Yeah, but if I'm in the cloud, I don't want to be down for 10 minutes, and it's not necessarily going to be 10 minutes. If you have a large database size, you could potentially be down for hours while you're copying data over if you're doing it offline. Right? On the so the only real way to do it is to, the only way to, the only way to, to give a customer the benefit of running their database in Trove rather than just running it in a cloud server <coughs> somewhere is that we make that that painless. That we I mean maybe it's maybe it's a pie in the sky view to say that it's not going to come offline at all and I'm not going to pay the penalty. But to keep that to a very very minimum, uh, and, and you have the ability to do that. But some have the ability to do that for certain scenarios. No, all have the ability to minimize the pain. I'm not talking about OpenBZ. You can completely take OpenBZ out of the. What about KVM? I'm not talking about online resizes. I'm just talking about. So, like, if, if the if the use case is we're we're never going to resize a, a a VM, and we're always going to migrate that data, right? You can do you can do that one of two ways. You can shut everything down and copy everything over, right? That's the most painful way mm -hmm. because depending on data size, that 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 downtime could be a production outage for that person for multiple hours. Sure. Hoping that it all goes right the first time and doesn't need to be resynced. The second way is to, like you were mentioning, you know, set up some sort of replication channel, uh, cut or maintain some sort of data consistency between the two, and then somehow switch that service over to the new one. Right? If you're going to do that, I think that that latter Solution while it's the harder way is the thing that distinguishes Trove between just running it yourself and a cloud server. I totally I'm in agreement with that. Right. I don't so know that. The, the, so, but that's a lot of responsibility, and um, are we even prepared to even think about it? Do we, does Trove even support the ability to think about that right now? Well, I mean, if we support, we sure if we support I guess replication, I we have to say. But we don't we don't, even, do. we don't even have an we agreement do. on what the replication <laughs> should maybe look like, let alone Let's actually have an idea of what the code's going to look like. So I'm wondering, though, I, are we getting ahead of ourselves? Should we? So, so I think it's a really good idea to make it possible for Trove in its own terms. Right? I like that. I think from an operator standpoint, if you're trying to set this up, it makes it less painful as Trove sort of does it this easier way. But I agree with what you're saying in that if we totally take out the ability to make things more efficient 
by doing research in the library of Bay, I think that's a mistake too. So maybe what we need to do is be thinking of a way to allow Trove to, Trove to do it, still allow for resizes, and I think if we let Trove sort of do it, that opens the door for rotation later on. But I, I totally agree, we shouldn't rip out the ability to resize because I do think that from an end user perspective, it's a lot nicer. And you can do things. Right. But I'm not easy. saying we remove resize. I'm saying we implement it differently. Yes, but it sounds like this way is all through Trove, and it forces it to take a certain amount of time. Right? Yeah, but I mean, the way I look at it, it takes that time for 90 the the hypervisors slash technologies in Nova anyway. And the special case for us is OpenBZ plus a SAN. Right, well, OpenBZ for case, right? there is LXC, and LXC exists in. It'd in be a real drag if we took this out and then the Docker project gets popular. We want to put it back in. I mean, sure. <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. I think just yeah. be, since we have the ability to do it, I don't think we should take it out saying, well, not every hypervisor can do this. Like we have to go implement it, that ability in the other hypervisors. You know, I think we should be able to use it. Well, it's only this new thing that. Proposing migration would only be supported on data stores that can do replication, mm -hmm. right? That's not necessarily true. I mean, how you replicate the data, it doesn't really matter with the underlying data stores. Some of them I mean, support you, native replication. Some of them you can write replication managers for. It's not that difficult. I mean, you can get data from one place to another a hundred different ways. I don't think that's going to be the limiting factor. But then the data store implementation needs to worry about the resets. Yeah, there's already awesome. going to be data source specific stuff, but we already have to work with the MyCNF and MyCNF. Well, you're, you're probably introducing like a dependency on having a DNS or a floating IP or something, right? Not every provider may have that. Like today, you don't have that dependency for that IP moves over. Right? Well, yeah. so maybe, maybe, rep, sorry, maybe a um, resize is a spin up a slave and give the user the ability to confirm the resize like you do in Nova. And so then the onus is upon them to change something if, if that needs to be the case. Change the IP, and then they can confirm resize. Because it'll be running, right? They can change the IP, and it's just a matter of decomming the old one. So having had to maintain slaves of MySQL, I can tell you that the process of truly being 100% certain that what exists on the master on the slave can be a painful process. Like you, you can you can guarantee with a certain level of assurance that the data is the same on a row by row level, right? Without having to do row by row comparison and inspection. But and that does seem like something. I mean, Trove should do. It, it just seems crazy making that you get this like cloud database service, and it's like okay, now resize it, and then we're telling the user, okay, now you better check because we could have screwed everything up, and it's like all their data. And so yeah. I don't know, like. I think in, I don't know. So on, on one side, you when you say you resize, you basically create a new copy. And so you already have the database if you if you resize. And and I mean if you do another copy, basically you override the existing database you just copied. But, well so a resize right now stops the instance uh, secure copies all of the data over to the and it right. lets you confirm it, and it deletes the old instance. Well, so the cool. new way would be spin up a vanilla instance, enable some sort of replication to it, and then yeah. kill the other instance when you're sure that the new instance. That is. case, if you can do it in synchronous mode, I mean, you can use Galera, for example. That might be a very good way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, there are there are some implications, like the fact that you must have at least three nodes. Because one is running and the other one must be the donor and you have the joiner on, on the other side, which is the new one, the resize. Right. And the other point is that you must have a balancer on top or something that mm -hmm. hides the whole operation. So you can have like a like a spin. Um, you go to you go to the current database for a while and then once everything is ready on the on the resize, new right. instance, you switch over. Right. That's the only way to do it, in my opinion, to do it. Um, in a kind of transparent way, as Trove should do. I wouldn't go for my verification. That's a different story. It almost seems like that's similar to what we do, what we already do with the backup, because you can create a new instance from a backup at that point. 
What if you just did a backup and then create a new one immediately after that? Because that's well, I mean, that's what the backup rights are going to after. Shut yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I mean, we, we are just, another idea. just for the record, we're totally tangenting, um, and I don't want to waste uh, Randall's time. Um, so I think Randall's enjoying this research. Uh, are you? Are you enjoying? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not playing Sudoku or something. <laughs> so I guess one question is also a question. Let's say we're in replication, as I might just say, we're using heat. I'm not handling these things. Right? I'm fun on doing these so. Yeah. If, if well. Safe. I mean, that's the thing. That's why we talked at the last summit about there has to be some way for heat to talk back to us and say, hey, go ahead and confirm. Um, and so I and I wonder if it's something that the heat team has time to do or if it's something we'll have to end up uh, pushing forward. My yeah, assumption is it would be us. Was it for us to basically make sure that something like that is in place before we do the presentation? I don't know. I mean, I'm I think Randall's waiting. You tactic shooter on top, right? Yeah, yeah. There's other cloud providers. You, 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 see, you seed it from a backup. This is your, your cost, right? You enable replication, then you have an operation safe from it. Really, the resize is syntactic shooter yeah. over those three operations. Oh, yeah, I mean, some of these things around. Oh, sorry. Go back. Start over. <laughs> okay. Um, at least some of these things around. Uh, letting other services or even the user insert themselves into our workflow and into our um, resource lifecycle. I think those things have general utility. And uh, as we talked about in Hong Kong, I think those things are certainly stuff people in our in our neck of the woods would like to take on in a matter of resources and stuff during Ice House. But if this is something we need to kind of push up the chain in, in Juno, I think they're, they're certainly be open to that. You know, the thing to, to know, though, is that Heat is not a workflow service, so a lot of these more sophisticated interactions, as you guys have been dis discussing, is are things Trove's going to have to do, or if Mistral ever, ever gets in a usable state may help, but those sorts of things are kind of beyond our, our scope. That's all I want to say. I mean, you see, I'm, just, I'm saying, right? Because ultimately, you're yeah. still delivering three operations. Austin, could you... Start saying that again because I was oh, yeah, trying sure. to do this. What I'm saying is, if you really think about it, a resize, in the, at least the scenario we're describing, is syntactic sugar over a couple of operations, right? One right. is seed a backup, usually just for cost across the network, right? You don't want to start off with nothing and then replicate a gigantic database across uh, um, if you do billing, right? So uh, if you seed it from a backup, then you set up replication, then you finish up the job, and if there's a promote equivalent operation, right? You have those three steps, and if you document those three steps, that's what a resize is. So even if this isn't in heat, I don't see the hard dependency here. Right, so I, I totally agree with that, and I was trying to get that across. Like, it will still be a resize to a customer. It's just about how we do it on the back end. And it seems like we should probably start with working with heat to do confirm resizes, mainly because other projects are going to need it as well, right? We're, we're, we're data store replication. Almost all data stores have some sort of replication, right? So we use some magic stuff around that, but other projects are going to need to be able to confirm resizes as well. And so maybe we start there, and then we in the future start thinking about crazy awesome ways to use data stores for resizes. Is, is the idea that like he's managing like a cluster of several different servers, you want to have confirm resize for all the resizes on those servers? Maybe that's what that gives us. Because I mean, certainly for one server, I just um, it seems, like, what do we really, I don't think we get anything, but I guess we're doing clustering and we get multiple servers. It goes into reset, confirm resize to all of them, the whole system. Right. Kind of stuff. Yes. Okay. Hey, Randall. Well, Randall, I kind of, I'm curious, how come there is no ability to just confirm a resize in heat? Because there is. It auto confirms it for you. Yes. <laughs> is there no way to tell heat, hey, dude, wait, let me confirm it. Like, Resize these several resources. Well, well like you said, it's not a workflow engine. Couldn't it just put the Yeah, give us give us a second. Our operators are working on it, Randall. You'll be online soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the reason is, is is really the necessity for it really hadn't come up. And kind of tries to get the 
uh, the key standpoint is your template is your expression of what you want the infrastructure to look like, and it's all very declarative. And you just say, Heap, go make my infrastructure look like this. And he says, sure, I'll go do that and let you know when I'm done, right? It was never envisioned as a do some of this and then give me a minute and then keep going. So, um, yeah, I just, it just, in the end, it just really never came up. And, and I will say this, he does have two resize strategies for Nova instances in that you can tell it either try to resize or, or try to resize in place or just blow away the instance and, and or spin up a new one and blow away the old one. So, but yeah, it, essentially it's just never really come up as a use case so far. I mean, could it be a use case then? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a valid use case. I, I mean, so here's the deal: is that the guys are completely <laughs> open to it, right? No one, no one is saying that we can't change the way he does resize confirmation if we want to. It's I, The only reason I brought that up is because that's just something that I have thought about um, in my, you know, in the deep places of my brain. What, what's that end looking like? Does it end up looking like a confirmed call, or would we need to write some sort of well, he No, no, no. We, he would have a call back to us for when, when um, at least when Clint and Randall and uh, all of us talked about it, he would have to call back to us when it knew it was done. Otherwise, we'd be polling in some fashion and have an extra step, and then he, he's, well, I mean, either way, it, there has to be some orchestration between the two. So I, I, we can probably figure out what the best way is, whether they just expose a second call or whether they call back to our exposed call. It seems like it would probably be easier for them to just expose a second call. Yeah. Because then they wouldn't have any hard dependencies on another service or on some nebulous like management API that everyone would have to implement in the same way with the same signature in order to provide the ability to do the, that. The callback politeness, you know, that seems much. Yeah, I mean, does yeah, may, like Randall? Does that seem ah? He did it. I got thumbs up. He's still on the oh, he's still on. Okay. He's still on the you got a thumb, thumbs up from. Okay. Sorry, you dropped off the main. You guys dropped off the main, uh, Winder. Where can we go with thinkers, I guess? Yeah, basically that's what I was, uh, what we what we discussed earlier is, is, is just that. He would provide you the ability to register some life cycle type callback, and he would just hit that, and when, uh, and, and basically pause or stop what it's doing, and either give you a callback to say, yeah, go ahead, or, you know, some similar uh, API endpoint on our part that says, yeah, okay, I can always hit this endpoint until he, this callback is fine, just keep going. Okay. Hey, can can Randall hear us now? No, we're muted. Yes. All Randall right. can hear well, us. Okay, so here, here's the thing. I'd really love to somehow avoid this callback thing, because having worked on resize uh, two or three times, right, with the fork and everything, it is just a pain to work on, on either of the resizes, right? And the callback thing seems like it's going to be really difficult to get working right. You know, you're going to have to have heat spinning up. You're going to be messing with code and heat and code. Now, I'm not just saying that we should do it because it's hard, but it seems more error prone. Um, and if we could, Randall, if we could do it the other way where he's just sort of like, I guess I can confirm this for you. What, do you think that's going to be, there's going to be real pushback against that in the heat community where they won't want to do it that way? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, oh. Again, a, a lot of these we, we we had these. This is similar to a discussion we had in Hong Kong, where you know, you know, these lifecycle callbacks. We, we see general utility there. You know, Savannah wants something similar, and there, you can come up with a dozen different scenarios where being able to kind of checkpoint certain parts of the orchestration come in handy and don't get us into the realm of workflow. That's our big thing is we don't want to be a workflow service. 
it would be a declarative orchestration service. And I don't think that this this jeopardizes that in any way. So from what I understand so far. That's right. Um, kind of, kind of a tangent, but um, what is Heat's dependency on the V2 versus the V3 of Keystone? Um, the reason I ask is because I know that there's some trust work that had to be done in order for us to be able to use uh, Heat without doing, without actually passing you the user's password every time. Yes, I believe that's on the ability to, to land in a complete state for Ice House. Um, it does mean that Heat itself natively has a dependency on Keystone v3 API, so you'll have to use that if, if you want to take advantage of, of those features. Um, we're also working on a shim for compatibility with the v2, but right now that means you won't get the trust um, the trust functionality, just because they, I mean, there's, there's nothing really equivalent there. Sure. So right now, in order to do things like you know talk to Swift from our guest agent, we end up passing a customer token through our API to our guest. Um, would that be something you think that that we could do with Heat instead of relying on trust and just give you guys a token to do something on behalf? Okay. I think that might. You guys already have a token. Yes. And a, a tenant that doesn't look any different to Heat. At all. The only thing you would miss is any any auditing we may or may not have around around the trust saying this was done on behalf of the user. But right, and, and it, we can't use wait conditions too, right? Uh, I believe that is a true uh, signal. Uh, yeah, native signal handlers, wait conditions, those things won't really work without V three or without trusts. But the good news is, is I'm sorry, let me, let me clarify that. Heat's response, if you send it a Heat, a template, <coughs> and you use a user, uh, an existing user, and in that template there are weight conditions and things like that, Heat takes care of setting up the trusts because Heat creates its own trust on that user's behalf. So you don't need native trust functionality for that. Heat will take care of that. Right, but if we're deploying heat in an environment with an existing keystone, we would need to rely on a V3 version of that, at least at present. I know. Yeah, at present. And if, do you know if the shim is going to be, I mean, it's going to be an ice house, I assume? Uh, um, Maybe. I think it's, it's in flight right now. Okay. So when we say Keystone like V3, is that... still not going to solve that problem. Right. You said, I need to run Heat on something that doesn't have V3 stood up yet. Will that include loose functionality? So will that include IDP? Like Keystone V3 with IDP or just Keystone V3? I, I don't believe they're one and the same. No? What's that? Uh, so identity provider is a keystone where you can have like multiple sources across geo regions, right? Physical regions, like you can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. Just talk louder at that thing. Okay. Uh, I just stand up and walk over to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michael can always translate. Yeah. So the question is, uh, as far as I know, Keystone V3 doesn't automatically assume IDPs to where you have like, let's say, different identity providers across multiple geo regions. So have a keystone in one region and a keystone in another region, will heat support the ability to kind of have federated identity across with what's landing in keystone in Icehouse? Not entirely sure there. Um, it assumes that uh, heat assumes you're also regionalizing heat as well. In that case, I would, I would think, meaning if you had an identity endpoint uh, for region X, You'd also have a heat endpoint for region X configured to use that identity endpoint. So if you had something federated, your strategy there would have to really kind of sort that in Keystone on, on in your implementation. Okay. So the other um, the other three sites that may potentially have an issue. 
that is also provisioned through EAT. Um, I, I know we've added a bunch of programs for sort of unmount and remount. Yeah. I don't know if, how we will actually handle that. I mean, that's all in the guest, though, right? No, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's all in the task manager. So instead of using the task manager to do that, we're going to say, we're going to do a stack update of a new volume size. Well, sure, but we would still do any steps we would do, then stack update, and then finish whatever other steps. But but that goes back to, you know, if we could register a callback with them, then when they were done with resizing the volume, whatever it took, then it would call back to us to finish the process. So should we wait until callbacks are critical and need before proceeding on the resizes for instance size? Callbacks, I, I don't. No, if callbacks will be available until the companies or the projects that need them will be, I, and um, you know, I, I, Savannah's talked about, so it may it may come to fruition before we get a chance to work on it. But it may be something that we need to work with the heat guys pretty closely because it really is like our requirements for what they need to do, right, Randall, King Henry? Yeah. And also, Randall is the other callbacks. The good news is, is it also, you know, it coincides nicely with other similar requirements. So, on our side, we're not too fussed about it. I mean, other than resize, don't we have some like post config callback that's also required in some data store scenarios, right? If you have a cluster, at some point you're going to need after the fact to go, Oh, hey, by the way, the seed IP list is X. Or some something that's only introspectable after the whole cluster is there. Can you do something, right? So you're going to need a callback there, too, or some facility to be able to do it. Yeah. It seems like this, the callback could be a, actually a decent general purpose thing for us. We're going to probably end up using it in multiple places, right? Yeah. So yeah. We would hook it into, I mean, whether, whether Specific one or not, the, the initial thought on our end was to <laughs> get into every single, see, at least give you the ability to add a callback to any single, any like type of event for any resource. So if you said, hey, I need these three things to spin up, and then when the last one's done, you know, let me know, you, you should be able to do that. And that won't significantly change the. the the heat or hot templates at present, right? I mean, that'll just be some, there's already like a do step one, do step two, do step three process with hot. Uh, hot doesn't let you specify explicitly the order of things to do in which order, or at least it tries to avoid that in some ways. Basically, dependencies are, are in the first, in the primary instance, their primary use cases, they're set up explicitly like. Let's say I have a load balancer and three servers, and the load balancer resource definition references those three servers by by virtue of making that hey use the attributes from these right. servers in this load balancer. He says, oh okay, that's a dependency there, so take care of the servers first, then do the load balancer. So it's sort of implicitly yeah, it's implicit about the dependency resolution. Uh, there's also a feature you can always add. Uh, a key to any resource called depends on. It says, I don't have any uh, implicit dependencies, but I, for whatever reason, know as the architect that I can't spend this resource up until these other things are ready. So you can have some control of those dependencies, but most of the time it's explicit or implicit, rather. Okay. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on was how do we take an existing deployment that with you know servers created through Nova and say it is our new and only path? Right. Uh, well, one of two steps, right? We can either one um, deal with a migration script and seed heat, or two have an understanding from Trove internally that these instances are not managed by heat and should be, if deleted or modified, used the old way. I would personally prefer to see us just insert a bunch of shit into Heat's database um, and, and turn it on, uh, rather than maintaining two different code paths 
a fleet forever. Because there's no guarantee that you know some small company has a private cloud stood up that went and installed Trove yesterday. It isn't going to you know have one instance around for the next ten years that uh, that isn't deleted and still used the old way. Well, for a bit of clarity, like I said earlier, that like it's guaranteed the heat will be used for provisioning, but it almost sounds like it's going to be heat is for everything because we're talking about resize, we're talking about deleting. So are we actually taking the stance that heat has to be used for all the workflow or just provisioning? Because if it's just provisioning, that's not a problem. Yeah. Whether it exists or not already is, is irrelevant. My right? understanding is we want it to stop top windows. Yeah. If it helps, heat does provisioning really well. Heat does workflow not at all. <laughs> right. But I was just, it's interesting to, I, I guess I don't know where we actually fall on that. Maybe well, I'm, from from what the TC said, it's pretty much exactly what Bitbull said. Do not Nova if you can talk to Heat. So every time we call a resize, every time we call a create a delete, um, update any security groups, anything like that, that should be going through. We should be built, adding that into the Heat template and giving it to Heat so that Heat can then go update. If Heat supports Yeah, but where it makes sense, that. though, right? I mean... No comment. <laughs> So we would have to go to the TC and tell them, look, it doesn't make sense right here. We have to continue to use Nova for this reason and for this purpose. Yeah, I mean, does, does anyone? We, we, we can probably call this about 30 minutes early. Right, not too, yeah. Anyone, anyone have any questions for Heat Core while Randall's here? Awesome. Dennis, do you have anything that you want to add? So, yes. Oh, you're, you I got. Think he's talking. What? He's muted. Dennis, you're on mute. Awesome. Um, so, call it. Any, good? All right. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining. And, um, oh, yeah, definitely. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. All right. Love you. Lunch break. Thank you. Uh, we stop the live stream instead of the afternoon. Yeah, I think that's fair to just stop it because we'll probably be 30 minutes. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, guys. And nice to put a face and a voice to the IRC handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's kill this neat. So I have a problem about the live stream. I have a like frozen laptop. My question. Is this going to be a regular stop? It's going to be regular stop for all. What's that? Uh, as in like this hangout for you? I mean, we can we can absolutely keep the hangout open or create a new one. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, let's we'll kill this now, but we'll call you back after lunch. You watching us eat? Unless you really want to. I mean, yeah. Unless you really just want to watch us. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then let's do this. We'll call you back when we start the replication talk, because that'll be good for you to be physically, you know, visible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're recording the live stream um, on YouTube, so uh, you should. Th those are going to stay around as artifacts, so we can always you can always go back and watch it tomorrow while we're recording. Awesome. Yeah, same here. Take care, Dennis.
Cool. Thanks, Dennis. Those are crazy ideas. And then all of a sudden, there's some other crazy ideas. Although I don't think anyone should have the word. I didn't actually want to go to this. I didn't 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 want to go to